takes a minute. Okay, we're live now. Hey guys, hey everybody, welcome. Hello. We got Rich here. I'm so excited to talk to him about his visit <laughs> with Darley. I'm excited to hear about it. I really am. Um, man, I feel like we should just get right into it. Well, maybe we'll wait for. Let's see. We got Mesera. Thanks, Mesera. Any other mods in here? Oh, Libra. Thanks. Are you the only two mods in here today? So far, so I know good. it's an early day, and we have a lot of night owls. <laughs> I was doing a live. I started my live at twelve thirty, Rich, last night. One of my lives. I'm I, I such been, a night owl. Well, I had it on last night, and I fell asleep. And uh, oh, okay. Bonnie, Bonnie goes, "Geez, oh man, I heard Zab all night long when I was trying to sleep." So, <laughs> oh my so, god, that's too um, funny. So I, I've been watching a lot of your shows. You ladies do really good, and and Bella, I love your sarcasm voice when you're reading testimony. It's like perfect. <laughs> Okay, thank you. That so, means a lot. <laughs> yeah, if they, if they ever do them, uh, you ladies ever wanted to do a mock trial, you'd be the lady for it, clearly. <laughs> thank you. <Okay. laughs> so. Yeah, she does. <laughs> She's awesome. I love it. But um, um, in, anyway, Zab, if I may, um, if I could tell uh, Darlie's friend to join the panel, that would be great because I know she's in the room. I just don't want to give her alias name up. So uh, anyway, Zab, you want to tell her to come on in or do whatever? Yeah, come join the panel. Definitely. I'm looking forward to it. Um, do you want me to, well, see, I don't have her email to share the invite. Did you share a link well, for her? I, I did share the link. Okay, okay good. Um, okay. So, um, and um, I, I'm sure she'll know what to do. She, she's a very nice, smart lady. So I'm, I'm sure she'll come in. Um, but anyway, you know, initially for the visitation, Darley Key told me, she goes, I'm going to be honest with you, Rich, it's a big pain in the butt. You know, you gotta you gotta drive hours away. Um, you gotta go through a lot of rigmarole to get in there, and then you can only visit for an hour because it's really a pain for just an hour. And I said, "Well, maybe, but I think it'll be well worth it." So we go down to Gatesville, and um, it's like a big prison town, and that's about all it is is prisons and a couple restaurants and a couple hotels. There there isn't much to it. Um, and so on the visitation, I went there. I get to the prison. I don't. I have no idea where to even go. There's no signs, no arrows, no nothing. You know, go this way or that way. And this prison's huge. And so I'm like, oh man. So I was telling Bonnie, I said, I'm going to get a shot driving around in here. You know, I mean, it's a maximum security prison. So I go up to the first watchtower, and the guard comes out of the watchtower, and you know, kind of looking at me funny and I, I, I said I'm sorry I you know and I told him what I was there for and he goes well go down straight and make a left and make a right and go here and there and I'm okay so wait they I, don't walk you down the no down no no so I had to I had to turn around and I I was thinking I was going the right way and I come up to another watchtower and a lady police officer was in there and she she come over and she said you know she's looking at me funny and I said well I'm I'm here to see a death row inmate. She goes, go park over there. Somebody will be with you shortly. So I did. And I did what she said. And then uh, this lady police officer come out. She looked like she was in an astronaut suit. She comes out and she goes, you guys, have you had your COVID-19 vaccine? I said, no. And she goes, here. And I mean, she pulls this Q-tip out like Matt Dillon and says, here, you know, you got to take the, you know, the test. So, so I go ahead and I do the, gross nasty thing that they want you to do i give it back <laughs> she takes it um back and then uh like i don't know 15 minutes later or something like that she uh kind of hollers over at me and goes like this and says come on so i walk over to another watchtower and there's uh two male security officers and then that female security officer. And what they do there is they kind of run the wand over you and then they, they pat you down and you're allowed to take up to $25 in change in there as long as it's in a plastic baggie and obviously they can inspect it. And that's for the vending machines and things like that. So I do all that. They're actually very professional. They're very nice. I didn't have any trouble. Um, and they went on ahead and they, they, they walk you through two of these, um, electronic lock, uh, fence gates and you walk through it. And then I went into this godforsaken looking button. It was nasty in there. And, um, 
and I wanted to use the restroom for the visit. And I, I was half afraid to go into the restroom, but, um, as for the restroom, said right there, I use the restroom, I come back out, and they said, have you ever done this before? They could probably tell I've never been there, and I, I said, no, not here, and um, he goes, well, you know, when you, you walk around this corner, she's going to be sitting right there, and I said, okay, and what they do, Zab, I don't know how well you can see this, this is what they give you. Okay, yeah, and, it's good, okay. Yeah, and this is a, one of their visitor mm -hmm. passes to the unit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so I go ahead back and, um, I walked around the corner. She's sitting right there. It's two foot in front of wow. me. And she goes, hi, Rich, how you been? How you doing? Real, <laughs> real, you know, uh, giddy, if you will. And I said, good. And she goes, how's your day today? And I said, well, I said, it's okay. So I'm, I'm a little starstruck at the moment. She goes, why? <laughs> she goes, it's just me. I said, well, I know. I said, but you have no idea. I said, you're a pretty hot commodity on uh, YouTube and Facebook and different various things and documentaries. But she doesn't understand it. She don't know what Facebook really is. She don't know what podcasts are. She don't understand the Internet. Um, it was 96 so, when she went in, right? Yeah. Yeah, she went in death row in February 97, but she had been in county prior to um, so, um, the first 20 minutes out of the hour, we pretty much just talked about gardening because she loves to talk about gardens. Um, and I like to talk about gardening and me and Bonnie are avid gardeners just like her. So we were having a good old time talking about gardening, you know, and I didn't want to really go in there and like start drilling her right away. I thought I'd be rude and oh, I just God. didn't want to do that. And I told her that. So, um, she says, I understand that, um, I understand that, uh, you have some questions for me. She told me, remember when I told you folks that I had some questions Said she's not going to answer them by mail, but if I come see her, she'll answer. I said, I do. And, um, one of the first questions I asked her was, cause I had asked my audience if there was anything anybody wanted me to ask her that I would do so as long as it was, you know, a reasonable request. One of the first questions I asked her was on the 911 tape, what she was promising Darren. And uh, she told me, and I told her, I said, listen, anything you tell me, I'm going to tell everybody unless you tell me not to. There are a couple things she told me not to say, but it has to do with the new ongoing investigation and nothing to do with questions on the case. Okay. So she's not too worried about that. But she told me, by the way, before I forget, uh, she looks great. She's uh, lost a significant amount of weight. Um, for somebody who's been on death row and that's 51 years old, I, I thought she looked pretty good. Wow. So um, very sharp. Her mind's real sharp. Um, really can hold on a good conversation. And I can do that too. So we get along really good. Is there like a something like a plexiglass in front of you or how does it set up? Yeah, there's uh yeah, the, you're in between a piece of glass. She sits on one side, oh, I God. sit on the other. And then there's like this little screen at the bottom of the glass where we are kind of talking through. Now they have two phone receivers at each unit where, you know, you talk to your, your you know, you have your visitation. Now, I said, would it be help? I said, I don't hear real well. I said, would it be better if we use phones? She goes, no, I can, I can hear everything you're saying. I said, okay. And she's kind of, she's got that loud voice, you know, and I, I'm kind of loud too, because I don't hear well. And so it, we, we did great. But um, I noticed her receiver was off the hook and kind of sitting down by the, by the screen. Now there was three guards that was back there and they were maybe from where me and Darley were sitting, maybe about 20 foot from us. And they were monitoring the, the, you know, the, the visitation. So I asked her, I said, what were you promising Darren on the 911 tape? And she said, uh, she goes, she was, you know what? I don't recall. She goes, I honest to God, don't remember. Now, mind you, Zab, I don't know. And I really couldn't just flat out ask her, but I don't know if she just didn't, want to tell me or if because she's being monitored she didn't want to tell me right then and there i'm not sure i don't know or she really didn't know 
And uh, she goes, you know, at that time, there's so much going on. I, I probably forgot more than I can remember. And, and she told me, she goes, she goes, I know how well you know my case. She goes, you probably know more about my case than I do at this point. Wow. You know, so um, and I said, well, you can also hear Darren saying in the background, oh, my God, did uh, Blake come in here? She goes, you know, it's funny you mention it. She goes, I don't remember him saying that. She goes, I'm not saying he didn't, but I don't remember him saying that. But she said, um, I've had other people tell me about that, too. And she goes, I'm not 100% certain. So we got talking a little bit about her neighbor. And, and is this Blake? Sorry, Rich, to interrupt you. Can you tell us who Blake is? Um, a little bit. Because, okay. because I got to be careful with it. But uh, what I, the person I'm referring to is David Blakeney. He lived uh, directly next door to Darley Lynn. If you if you're looking at Darley Lynn's house from the street in the front yard, he was the house to the left. Okay. And uh, between his house and the Guzman's house is where the walkthrough was and where the sock was found down by the trash receptacle or the um, the sewer opening. Um, so uh, we got to talk a little bit about that, and then we got to talking about Barry Fife. Now this is this is the kicker. You guys are gonna like. And I said, Darley, I said, I know you confronted Barry Fife. I said, what did you confront him about? What was said? What did he say to you? And I said, because he ain't talking. He's not talking to nobody. She goes, well, Darren's wallet got stolen. And he had credit cards in there. And lo and behold, we got one of the credit card receipts back. And it had um, Barry Fife's brother's signature at the bottom of the slip. He goes, how stupid could somebody be? And so uh, she went over there and started raging. And um, well, needless to say, I'm not going to use the language that I, I don't, I don't want to do that here, but they just, he basically told her to get out of here. You have no idea what I'm capable of doing. You know, just get out. Uh, and she told me, she goes, you know, Rich, she goes, you know, when I was that young, I just didn't think about danger. I didn't think about something like this that could have happened. I didn't know everything that, you know, that was going on behind the scenes that I didn't know about. And I just didn't think about it. And I, I guess it's, a, it's understandable. She's very sincere when, when she talks. And, um, and I got to try to remember everything we talked about. Um, and... Let's see. We also, uh, oh, and another thing is when uh, Bathsheba, which I know you ladies know, she wanted me to ask her a question. And the question was, when did Darren give Drake to um, the nurse across the street? And, because um, you know, she had to come over to the house. And where, where were they at in the house? When did this occur? And Darley said, well, she goes, well, she goes, the best that I can recall, she said, I was at the front door and I passed out cold. And when I came to, there's a bunch of paramedics over me. And when that, when I came to, um, uh, the neighbor had had Drake in her arms. Mm -hmm. So she goes, that, that's about the best answer I can give for you. You know, and I got a thinking about it. I was kind of hoping for a little bit of a better result with some of the questions, but I've been in not as severe as a situation as her, but not too far from it. So things just, you, you don't react though. You know, you, you're not, you're not trying to remember things, you know, you're trying to get through it. Yeah. And um, anyway, I told her, I, I said, you know, I said, Barry Fife surrounds your whole case. She goes, I know he does. So, um, let's see. Um, and then of course she asked me, did you get, why didn't you get the vaccine yet? <laughs> and, and I said, well, I, I said, I, I don't know if you want me to go into all that right now. I said, it'll use up the time of the visitation. So, um, I asked her if she'd gotten it. She said she did. And I asked her, made her sick. She said, well, the, the next day I was, real exhausted and I had the chills and I didn't feel real good. And then after that, I was fine. Um, so, um, she did touch base with me a little bit about the stuff going on with the case, which she did ask me not to say publicly at this time. 
And um, I can tell you this. Uh, I've had a lot of extensive training into talking to people and being able to look at them and tell if they're lying, if they're being deceiving, if they're this or that. And I didn't get anything from her. But Darlie Lynn is a... Uh, what I did notice is that the way she communicates, she, she means no harm with it, but it almost looks suspicious, if that makes sense. And this is just being honest. I mean, mm -hmm. she's a great friend of mine. I, I believe her with, you know, I've never caught her in a lie. And I did ask her, Zab, about, it's coming back here slowly. I did ask her about the uh, police reports. I said, your voluntary police statements were different, darling. I said, why were they different? She goes, well, she goes, first of all, she go, and, and you know, she said that that Rollup Police Department, they, they treated them bad, which I know you know about some of that, Zav, because I've been watching your stuff and I, I'm seeing you catch it. Um, when, when she got released from the intensive care unit, the Rollup Police Department took her and Darren from the hospital to the police station right right from there and the, she said that they were drilling her and Darren for about six or seven hours and she wanted to get out of there yeah, said she yeah. didn't feel good she was you know um, loopy from a lot of the different medications she was on and she just wanted to get out of there so she said she did she was to the point where she didn't even really care what the voluntary statement said she said she didn't really realize how serious it really was because she really believed that innocent people don't need attorneys. Well, as we all know, they most certainly do, which she knows that now. I promise you she does. Um, she said, and then she had to go down there again, and it was the same day of the uh, viewing of her boys at the funeral home. And she kept telling them, listen, I'm late. I, I want to go to my boys' funeral. And they kept drilling, 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 drilling. They wouldn't leave her alone. They were upsetting her and, and everything else. And finally she left. And she was two hours late in getting to the viewing of the boys as a result. But she's very upset about that. And, um, and that's... Well, so it was two hours because we just read Darren's testimony. And he mentioned, you know, um, I wasn't happy about being late to visit my, to, you know, see my son's viewing. We didn't realize it was two hours. Yeah. She told me it was two hours. She was two wow. hours late. Um, mm -hmm. She said she was really upset about it and uh, which, you know, rightly so. Um, and then I know you guys were seeing that, uh, talking about that on the show, how, you know, cause Darren and Darley were very, very cooperative with the, with the detectives and the police. And they, um, they really felt as though they were doing a good job initially. And then um, until the, the tide turned, you know, they were, they were trying to build a case on her is what they were doing. And they, of course, you know, they're handing over everything that they want. So of course they're going to be nice to them about it because they're giving them everything they want. And then lo and behold, they get the search warrant. They, they go bust a glass door open when they didn't have to do any of that. Darren and Darley both were uh, extremely forthcoming on giving them everything, letting them go to the house. Darren actually gave them the keys to their cars, the boat, the business, everything. Um, and I asked Darley Lynn, I said, can you tell me if Darren at all was trying to control you as far as what to write on those voluntary statements? She said, no, he wasn't. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I, yes. Can we do something really quick? Can you give us... For the for those of us in chat who don't know anything about Darley and don't know about the crime she is sitting on death row for, can you give us like a little short of when it happened and how she ended up on death row? Uh, sure. Um, on uh, June 6th at around 2.30 in the morning of 1996, um, well, do you want me to, I, I, I'll, I prefer to give the real story as to what happened, not the uh, documentaries or the uh, Rollett Police Department or um, any. Uh, sure. Give us, give us it, give it to us your way. I just want everyone um, who's in chat who may never have heard of her, who's just joined. 
joining us, maybe for the first time, to get a basis of who Darlie is and why we're talking about her today. Well, the, the best way I, I can I can describe Darlie as as far as personality, she's a she's a very charming woman. She really is, and very kind hearted. And um, everything that she said she said to me was in complete kindness and, and respect and caring. She's very concerned that I didn't get that vaccine. You need to get that vaccine now before, you know, and just stuff like that. But um, when when this occurred in 1996, Darlie Lynn was 26 years old. Um, and I think she would openly admit that uh, she was a, a, a very naive young woman. Um, she never really had any serious type of employment to speak of. She was a, a stay-at-home mom and wife, didn't have a lot of experience in the employment world, didn't have a lot of experience in the world in general. Her husband at the time was making uh, very good money for that, that era and um, still would be good money today, actually. And uh, yeah, they were living the American dream. And lo and behold, um, things started going downhill a little bit as we got into 1995, late 1995 and early 1996. Um, let's see, how can I say this to be respectful? Uh, Darren started involving himself in some pretty shysty business uh, with people he shouldn't have been doing, having doing business with and letting, and I'm not referring to his Tesnek business because he owned Tesnek and Rollet at the time. Uh, there was probably some shady stuff there too, but needless to say, their income began to drop um, and stressors began to arise as, as a result of uh, a lot of the stuff that Darren was involved in and doing and um, um, there was just a lot of pressure on Darlie. Uh, she had uh, three young children at home. Uh, Devin was uh, a very hyperactive child, um, but a really a wonderful child. From I heard Damon was too. I heard all three of them were, were just incredible, beautiful little guys. Um, anybody who knew them can barely even have a conversation with that, w with me about it without shedding tears because, you know, 25 years later. So, I mean, that, that definitely should tell you something. Um, and so things began to get uh, pretty rough around the household. Uh, There's started having a lot of arguments. Things started going wrong. Darlie Lynn said she did tell me this story that I was unaware of. She said that and I asked her. Uh, I, I said, it's my understanding that Darren was a pacifist. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. she, she said, absolutely. She said, but there was this one time that he got pretty ferocious with me. And I said, can you tell me about it? She goes, well, I went down to test neck and we were arguing about stuff. And he had made some smart aleck remark to me. And I picked up a Rolodex and whipped it at his head. And she goes, and I'm going to be honest with you, Rich. I don't do stuff like that. But he really made me mad. And I, I said, geez. I said, I've never heard of this before. She said, no. She said, but when I did that, he put his gun in my face. And, uh, oh and, and, uh, okay. and she said, she said, I told him. She goes, Darren, you know, as well as I do, you're not going to use that thing. And then she said she he turned a gun on himself. Okay. And this happened at Tesnek. Wow. Um, so um, it's interesting. I, I think I think Darren may be a pacifist. I've heard this from a lot of people. But I think, you know, the wrong thing gets said to him or the wrong thing occurs, he he. He could be a flip out. I just get that impression. I see. Um, so I, I wanted to make sure I got that story in with you as well. But <laughs> she said any time she would mention the word divorce or separation, he'd freak out like that. Um, and so anyway, on the night of June 5th, 1996, Darley had been sleeping on the couch downstairs for about a week. Because um, her and Darren were getting along very well and things were stressful uh, with the business, with finances and just shady business that Darren was involved in. 
and that night um because her sister dana had been staying with him at the house because dana worked at test neck a little bit with darren and uh on that particular night um darley lynn sent dana home and um evidently when darren come back there had been more of an argument Okay, I don't know the fullest extent of this argument, but Darley Lynn did tell me that on that night, she did tell Darren that she wanted a separation, quote unquote. And he started getting real upset again. Uh, needless to say, <clears throat> she went to sleep downstairs. Darren went upstairs. She's laying there watching television. She conked out. So the next thing she knew. Rich, sorry to interrupt you again, is has, are you allowed to say or has she told you the reason she went to sleep downstairs? Not specifically. She okay. didn't. But um, she told me she it seemed like she was kind of had her guard up a little bit as to how she was saying it because of the, the monitorization of, of our visitation is the way it appeared to me clearly. But she told me she goes. He goes, you know, that night I did ask him for a separation. She goes, and I know you know this case. It almost seemed to me like she was saying, you already know what transpired. And, and, and you know, they're, 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 Darren was having affairs, uh, uh, extramarital affairs. Things in the business were bad. She was involved. He, he was involved with shady stuff with Barry Fight. This stuff was starting to catch up. And um, Darren... You know, even Darley Key told me that, you know, Darren was always big, easy to make a deal. Let's make a deal. You know, let's do it on a handshake. Yeah. Let's make a deal uh, with everything. You know, just uh, just one of them kind of people. And uh, so, but you can bet the farm. I don't know that I want to say it because I don't have 100% proof on it, but I, you can bet the farm. I got a real good idea what got said that night. But I, th I think... It would be more fair to say that when Darley Lynn said that, he, uh, you know, she wanted a separation because she even told me he'd get real upset if that got brought up. Hmm. And it just kind of makes me wonder. But anyway, um, but she still believes that he had nothing to do with it on a physical standpoint. Okay. I'll um, ask you that. Okay. Hmm. Well, I, I, believe that as well i don't believe that he had anything to do with it on a physical state i believe it's his fault but i don't believe that he did it um so and i told darley lynn that and she in a roundabout way agreed with me on that um so anyway everybody goes to sleep the next thing darley lynn knows is that her son damon is tapping her on the shoulder saying mommy 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 she like got startled and come to and when she come to, she seen a man at the end of the couch walking into the kitchen. Um, but, you know, it was kind of like a a dim darkness, if you will, in, in the Roman room where Darla Lynn was sleeping. The television was on, but no lights were on. So it's kind of like that dim darkness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she, she couldn't really make the guy out, but she got a little bit of his description, <laughs> but it wasn't nothing spectacular. And... and she got up off the couch, not realizing anybody's even hurt yet. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, I heard that Kevin on your program. Oh, that, that, you know, he was, uh, she was chasing him. She wasn't chased. She never said she chased him. She didn't know what was going on. You got to remember, she's just waking up. Uh. And let alone from a traumatic injury. Now, she's just waking up. You know, she's kind of sees like a shadow of a man that's, you know, maybe uh, six, six to ten foot away from her, walking away from her. And uh, so she gets up to kind of go see what's going on. So she gets up, she goes over there, she tells, Damon's kind of following her, but she tells him, now, you, you wait, stay here, stay here. And uh, which obviously is where uh, Damon ended up collapsing, you know, as a result because of uh, the horrific wounds that he sustained from the attack and so you know she goes through the kitchen and she gets to the entrance way of the utility room and lo and behold there's a knife on the on the on the ground and 
at, at this point, I mean, she picks up the knife. She sees that it's covered in blood. She noticed something isn't right. She goes back. She turns on a light. She's in a mirror. Now we got a problem. We, we, she's got, you know, she's cut here. She's stabbed here. You know, she's waking up. She's more conscious at this point, realizing she's got a nasty stab wound to the right hand, arm, I'm sorry. And so she goes into the kitchen. She puts a knife down. Realizing something's wrong, she starts screaming for Darren. Darren, at this point, runs down the stairs. And she told me, she said, Rich, you know, a lot of people say, you know, that was Darren, that was Darren. She goes, Rich, I saw him come down the stairs. And I know that the man that I saw didn't go upstairs. He went out through the utility room. She goes, I, I clearly know. She goes, I know what I saw. That's what she told me. Now, Darren comes downstairs you know, what the hell's going on? Darlie Lynn is, is screaming at the top of her lungs. I guess it was really frightening, too. Uh, she's screaming, Devin, 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 Devin. A at this point, uh, Darlie Lynn calls 911. Darren runs into the Roman room. He sees the first, first boy that he saw was Damon, but, you know, he was just kind of like moving a little bit, but you could clearly tell something was seriously wrong with him. And, and, um, very awful, very awful story. I hate to even to discuss it, to be honest with you. He runs over to Devin, and clearly Devin is already deceased. I mean, he had uh, two vicious stab wounds to the chest, one of which uh, pierced his heart and severed his pulmonary artery to his heart, um, which would cause massive bleeding. Um, and anyway... Uh, he tried to uh, do CPR on Devin, and uh, he, he blew into his mouth. And at that point, a shower of blood and air just shot out of the knife wounds out of his chest. Sh you know, showered him with blood. And, you know, I mean, use your imagination, I guess. And um, he said that before he went over to Devin, though, he went, he went over to Damon first, and he checked Damon to see if he had a pulse. He didn't have a pulse, but he was moving a little bit. Uh, so he, and he was clearly on his way out. And so um, the first thing that Darren does after he does the CPR thing, and it's nasty, he tried blowing into the chest wound and everything else because he's in a panic. Mm -hmm. it, it's pure pandemonium going on at this point. So he decides that he's going to go, go see Karen Neal, which is the nurse across the street and friends of, with the Routiers. Uh, Rebecca Neal, which was their daughter, used to frequent the Routiers' house uh, a lot. And she actually testified at the trial. If you ladies haven't come up to that testimony yet, you will. Um, and Rebecca Neal at the time, I believe, was 12 years old. And uh, she's come over and helped you know, Darla Lynn with Dre, because, you know, you know, you know, young gals, you know, preteen years, you know, they, they love babies. They want to hold babies and hang out, you know. So and Darlie and, was 26 and she was really pretty and young and probably fun. So a 12 year old would obviously gravitate, I would think, towards somebody like Darlie. Oh, of course. Of course. And Darlie Lynn was fun. And, and you know, it's it, sad to say. Even in prison, she's fun. We are having a good old time in there, uh, laughing and chuckling about things and all kinds of stuff. She just has a really good way of of communicating. But it's in a way, it's almost kind of strange, mm -hmm. but um, it's just her mentality. It's not deceptive. It's not manipulative. I didn't get any of that. I didn't get any of that out of her. Um, and your friend um, who was going to join us that knows Darlie. She says that she doesn't have a good pair of um, headphones. So oh. she's just going to be in chat. But is that the same thing you hear from? Because I know you've been in this case for so long. And um, so you, you've met people that know Darlie. Is that also things that people that know Darlie say about her personality? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Um, a, a doting mother, a, a very caring individual. You know, there there was a neighbor that they had over there on Eagle uh, Drive that they um, they were having a hard time making their house payment and stuff like that. And Darlene Lynn made their house payment for them. 
you know, and even even Basha Javel, for example. Which, you know, I know I was watching you ladies do the transcripts on her. I, I think you, you kind of figured her out pretty quick. But um, they used to loan her money all the time. And she even testified to that. That's um, true. She did. With yeah, a chip on her shoulder. <laughs> the whole time. Well, I, I asked Darlie Lynn about her. and um, Oh, you, you know, did this oh, visit? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, oh, I, I okay. asked. Her. Well, I asked her. I said, I said Brian St. John because Darlie Lynn knows who Brian St. John is very mm -hmm. well, and um, so Brian St. John did an incredible interview with uh, Basha Jabel. I said he actually did two. I said one was hours and hours long. I said and the other one was fairly brief. I said, but um, said some very interesting things, Darlie, and I don't think anybody even told Darlie about this stuff. She it certainly come to her as surprise and I told her I said she told uh, Brian St. John that when she come over to the house that night or that afternoon and she said she seen Damon out in the yard playing with a stick and asked and he looked sad and depressed and she went up to him and said what, what's the matter Damon and she said that Damon told her well I'd like to spend the night at your house. Bosch said, well, so, well I, I got stuff to do tonight. I, I can't do that. And why would you want to stay at my house? Basha said. And Damon said, well, because mommy's being mean again. I told Darla Lynn about that. And it caught her on surprise because I don't think she's ever heard it before. She goes, that is simply not true. She said, Basha Javel did. She goes, the kids were out in the yard playing when she got to my house at about 430. And the first thing she did was came into my house and got a beer, which that did get testified to, mind you. And she said she never even went out in that. You shouldn't even talk to the boys that afternoon. So she says she goes, that is just simply not true. And um, isn't that the one that the boys kind of didn't like that much from te from like the testimony? You kind of get that flavor that the boys didn't gravitate towards Basha very well. Well, I've I've had friends of Darlie Lynn tell me that that the boys didn't 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 really like her that much. Now I do believe, and I agree with Brian St. John that that Basha Javel did really love those boys. I really believe that she did. Okay. You know, I, I don't know. Zab, have you ever had the chance to listen to that interview? Wow, that was great. And, you know, I even told Darlie Lynn, I said, you know, you got to give Brian St. John credit. I said, that was one of the best interviews on your case I've ever seen. Wow, um, I'll have to check it out. I haven't um, did he erase it, though? Did he erase he, it off his... Yeah. Oh, really? Uh, he... he I, I don't want to tell the guy's business. I, let's just put it this way. He he did get rid of all, all of his darling stuff, mm -hmm. but there was issues going on. And if he if he chooses to tell you, he'll tell you, but mm -hmm. I'd rather him do it. Um, but he he done away with it. He actually did a real short little uh, podcast um, about me and being on my podcast and very nice things to say about and we're clearly on the opposite ends right we, we've debated the case but we we've always been able to respect one another right um but there are a lot of people that mr saint john has talked to in the past where vicious arguments would break out mm -hmm. so um uh, but brian saint john he's he's done quite a bit of changing with, with, with his life he's he's like it's not so hot under the collar as he used to be with people and uh mm -hmm. you know he, but he wanted to come on and um we didn't hear from him after that so brian if you're listening <laughs> you oh, want to come me, on he'll watch he'll watch this show he watches everything on darling and believe me when i tell you he knows the case he knows yeah. the case very well um However, and, and, and no offense to him and, and no disrespect, man, he, you know, Cyrilda Routier told him, because I, I heard her tell him this on the interview. She said, you know, Brian, it's not that you're stupid or anything. It's just that you got the wrong information. You know, um, I, I think that's the most respectful way to describe it. A lot of people like you, you had that, that Kevin on your program, Zab, and I was listening to that debate. He knows the, that that fellow knows the case. He seemed like a very intelligent man, but he's very misinformed. 
I, I promise you, he's very misinformed. There's things I know about the case that have not really been broadcasted at this point that blow him off his seat. And one of the things, which I'm not going to say what it is, you guys talked about very thoroughly on your program. And I mean, it, it's, it's amazing. And I promise you, Zeb, when I'm allowed to release the information, I'll let you know. Yeah, it's okay, wild. Yeah, it is yeah. wild. Wow. All right. Um, but, um, uh, but back to it, um, you know, they, they, uh, contaminated a lot of the evidence. There were a lot of, um, there were a lot of um, very inexperienced detectives and police officers on that type of crime that investigated it. What really gets me, what, what I, you know, and I, it's funny, Zeb, you've always talked about the, the possible corruption around this case. Well, I got one better for you. And I think you're on the right track because James Patterson, who was the lead detective on the investigation, he used to be a narcotics uh, officer. And now all of a sudden he's a lead detective in a murder case, number one. But number two, his son, Chadwick Patterson, had huge involvement with Barry Fife and knew Darren, too. Knew um, David Blakeney. Knew different people. And now all of a sudden this guy's a lead detective in this murder case. And... He was given, I actually have the receipts on this, I have copies of it, hundreds of leads from people on this investigation, and he disregarded all of them, except for, he didn't want the information, unless it had to do with something to damn Darley with. Yeah, I believe it, definitely, wow. Wow. Um, and, you know, I heard Kevin say something on your program. He makes a valid point. He says, well, you know, police officers, you know, they're paid the same, you know, whether or not, you know, they're going to give you the truth or not. Why wouldn't they want to give you the truth? But see, what Kevin is very unaware of, okay, what I know for a fact is that the corruption, I know that Jim Patterson, I can prove this, that Jim Patterson was given payoffs right and left to look the other way. From drugs that were getting run in from Dallas to Garland through Rowlett. A lot of it was under the supervision of Barry Fife, mind you. And I, I just find all this to be so interesting. Even Jim Patterson's own son, Chadwick Patterson, um, he actually went to the investigators to tell on his dad. He said, my dad is not following up on these leads in this investigation. And I think, I think Chadwick was getting uh, a little bit nervous because some people were pointing the fingers at him. And rightly so, if you take a deep dive into the case, um, they actually tried comparing because Chadwick Patterson is, um, is a career criminal for all intents and purposes, kind of like Barry Fife. And uh, he's got records and they tried to compare his fingerprints to J85 and it wasn't a match. But um, they did try to, you know, they were looking at him funny. Uh, but anyway, I don't want to go off too deep on a tangent. So do you want to hear more about the the story or did you want to talk more about I the want to hear. I personally want you to go back to when you told Darlie about Basha um, and that what, um, you know, about okay. the thing. Yeah. <laughs> no, I got you. And, well, I, I told her, I said... Uh, I said, Darlie, I said, you know, I, there's a lot of, a lot of mixed emotions out there about, you know, your guys' relationship with Basha. And, um, I told her, I said, you know, the word is Darlie that, uh, Darren used to bring home eight balls of cocaine and then would ask Basha, Javel and you to hop in the sack all together. I said, is that true? Mm -hmm. That's a, it's a rough question. I admit it. She goes, she goes, I didn't do any cocaine. She goes, I've never, I didn't do cocaine. And um, she goes, uh, she said she didn't have anything to do with doing cocaine, which you almost, you can't, you can't call her out on that, actually, because you got to remember her toxicology report from Baylor University Hospital was negative across the board. Even for marijuana, it was negative. Um, so she said that she don't, she, that, that didn't happen. She said that that was never asked. Uh, to her, 
she said she don't know if you know her and Darren had talked about that or not said because they were oftentimes together you know because of work and so on mm -hmm. and so forth but she said she was never involved in a conversation like that with him but she did tell me that she said you know I, I did a lot of things when I was young that I would never think about doing now she didn't she wasn't specific but I think what she was probably referring to was she had a little bit of a wild lifestyle as as a young woman like a lot of us do I did too when you know I was that age it, you know me and Darley are very close to the same age so um, it's just how it was back then it, it kind of made you fit in and belong if you will so um, but she was uh, she said you know Basha was they said we, we tried to treat her like she was a member of the family because we wanted to make her feel that way, but we were very wrong in doing so. And, I mean, she did tell me that. Um, what does she think about the way Basha talked about her on the stand? She didn't make, she wasn't very specific about that, but I could clearly tell by her body language. Um, her facial expressions is one thing that I noticed. If you you touch on something that I mean, she'd be laughing, smiling, giddy like. You hit a note with something that she doesn't want to talk about. You want to talk about a complete change in her facial expression, which you can get that out of anybody. I mean, hers are real dramatic though, extremely <laughs> dramatic. She's a bit on the high strung side kind of kind of person. But that's passionate, not that, very much so. Right. That that's the perfect word for it. Passionate. Um, so her, I, I mean, she clearly has, um, she doesn't have very good things to say about Basha. I think that for years, she, ba Basha would actually bother her a lot. She was trying to just be kind and helpful because Basha had a lot of issues. She had a lot of head problems. She had a lot of drug addiction issues alcohol issues um, and she also has a you know a, a criminal rap sheet of about I believe it's four or five different felony charges from different various things from false IDs to uh, selling drugs and things of that nature um, but no she doesn't she doesn't talk very highly of Basha at all and I mean, she must have felt betrayed because here's Basha who was quote unquote like her best friend a family member that at that whole gravesite birthday party she was hugging on her and mourning with her and then gets on the stand and it's like a 180 well you, you see there there's some things that a lot of people don't know i i got this from a good source that somebody that knows all of them very well but i i don't i haven't been given permission to say it but who told me this at this point but this person told me that Darren was promising Basha like a partnership into the business if you will a certain percent mm -hmm. different various things and also that Basha was very jealous of Darley Lynn. Basha wasn't um, nearly as attractive as Darley was at that time and she um, she wanted to be like Darley, if you will. She wanted to have that money. She wanted to have that nice home. Uh, her the marriage that Basha Javel had was in complete shambles, and um, you know she just didn't have it going on. She had a lot of issues going on. Yeah, that's and that's kind of her testimony. Kind of reeked a little. I mean, you know, when we get on and we do, we read the transcripts. It's the first time we're reading them. So, and our reactions are what you get if if anyone in chat hasn't heard yeah, our transcripts. You, you, I, I on that uh, particular transcript, uh, you guys, I know you ladies were having a ball with that um, situation with her looking at the fireplace. Um, <laughs> yeah, do you know any insight into that? <laughs> I, well, I can, I can tell you, you know. The thing is, and I told Darley Lynn this, I said, you know, everything that Basha Javel said to Brian St. John, of course, not under the laws of perjury, um, was totally different what she testified to at trial. The stuff that she was telling Brian St. John, she didn't even come remotely close um, 
to testifying to that. Not even close. Um, I personally believe, I don't know this, but I believe that Basha Jabel kind of wanted Darlie Lynn out of the picture because she wanted to take her place, more or less. I really believe that. So, and, and not just that, I, she really loved those little boys. I really believe she did. I don't think they loved her very much. Right. <laughs> she, she definitely loved those little boys. I don't doubt that for a minute. That's kind of like the flavor we got from that was that there was a lot, it seemed like it was like jealousy stuff. Like she's like, Darlie was very materialistic and, and all she cared, like she kept repeating that. And it was like, and of well, course Mulder, the defense isn't objecting to any opinions. But and, I, and I'm also sure that she was probably tutored by the prosecution, just like all the nurses were from Baylor University Hospital. Right. So, you know, it, it's, Sadly, it's the way it goes. But, you know, another thing that, and, and I know some folks are commenting, Zab, and I, you know, I, I, I did a podcast on this with Tara. Uh, and, um, you know, if you look at the crime scene photos, you know, um, uh, Kevin was making the mention about the, um, the towels and that there was no evidence of wet towels. I can prove there are wet towels here. I yeah. Can I, prove mean, there were I, wet I towels. believe you. Um, and as far as the, you know, the blood in the sink and a cleanup. Well, if she's wetting towels from the sink, of course it's going to wash the yeah, blood that's what down I, the drain. I, I responded to that one person. I was like, well, yeah, she didn't actually have to like clean it up. She was just washing down the drain as she was wetting the towels. It makes sense to me. I mean. Well, and, and one, one better for you too is, um, you know, they, uh, uh, you know, he, he was saying that there, there's there's all kinds of towels laying around the house. Look at the crime scene photos. You can see them everywhere. Mm -hmm. You can see the one on the kitchen floor. I forget what ex exhibit it is. But there's one on the kitchen floor where the cordless phone is laying on the floor. You can see the towel there. It's clearly wet, and it clearly has blood on it. Clearly. Mm -hmm. And then I do a demonstration on my podcast, the difference between a dry, bloody towel and a wet, bloody towel. Because you can actually see how the, the blood gets a little bit more diluted in a, in a wet, bloody towel than from a dry towel. Oh, that's a good so, idea to show that. Okay, I have to check yeah, that out. Yeah. yeah I mean, uh, but, uh, but I mean, I, I don't I don't mean no disrespect to Kevin. I, I mean, he seems like a very intelligent man, but he, he's just misinformed on some stuff. There's there's a lot of misinformation in the case. You know, uh, Zab, I heard you were talking about like the sock, which is probably the, the most hardest thing in the world to figure out on the case. Um, but. Darley just clearly didn't have enough time. I heard you say that, Zav. Uh, you know, but Zav, I have to give you ladies credit and Bella as well. You you entertain both sides. You really have to. This case is very very hard uh, because there's a lot to it, and it's good that you look at both sides and don't just automatically go to one side. Um, that that's excellent. That's the only way to do it in this case to have it make sense. Thank um, you, Rich. Yeah, thank you. But, that means a lot. But anyway, when we were we were getting uh, close to the oh, and I asked Darlie Lynn. I said, Darlie Lynn, I've had this pile of change here sitting here at the table, and our hour of visitation's almost up. I said, you want me to get you something out of the vending machine? I said, I brought, I think, what was it, Bonnie, sixteen dollars and fifty cents or something, and change in quarters that I took in there. And the whole time I got to sit in there, and she wouldn't ask me for anything. And finally, mm -hmm. I said, do you want something? She goes, well, if you want to get me something, she goes, get me get me uh, meat and cheese sticks and a Coca-Cola. That sounds great. Mm -hmm. And she goes, but she goes, because everything's better with meat and bacon, you know. And I said, <laughs> well, I understand that. She said, she said, but if, if they don't have the meat and cheese sticks, she said a bag of chips would be fine. Nothing more. And um, I said, okay. So I, I went out and I got them. And then when I walked back in, I had to walk around to the other side, hand it to, to the guards. They had to look at it. And then the guard brought it over to Darley to, to have. So, um, but, you know, so many people talk about how money hungry she is. She never asked me for money. She never asked me for anything. Um, just her friendship. And she asks me, she goes, Rich, I know you're an investigator. Find the killers. You've got to find the killers. So what I did 
And I told her, I said, when I initially went into your case all that long time ago, I thought you were guilty of sin. And I said, until I took a, a deeper dive and started seeing things didn't make sense. And I said, you know, I get all these conflicting stories. So what I did was I got the crime scene evidence and I matched it to what you said had occurred and it matches perfectly and I can prove it. And she goes, it's funny you say that, Rich. It's exactly what the Innocence Project told me. Nice. Yes. So, so um, you know, so it... Uh, and you I, guys in chat that don't know that the Innocence Project has picked up Darley's case and it is sometimes debated. Well, no, it's just lawyers that are from the Innocence Project. Rich, can you tell us a little bit? I mean, as much as you can about it. Well, I, I, I could actually tell you a lot, but Dar Darlene was very specific about keeping a lot of stuff down and and yeah. rightly so because it, it causes a lot of problems. Absolutely. Um, what I can tell you and this has been made public that the Innocence Project does have this case. I can tell you that they are working on some really good stuff they have found and they are dealing with. And um, uh, let's just put it this way. It looks real good. I, I so wish I could say more. I kind of feel almost like a thug not being able to tell you more, but no, I don't, I, I don't want to. Yeah. We, yeah, we are all on the same page that, you know, we want justice when all is said and done and for the boys. And so, and so does she. Right. And if anything were to jeopardize that, you know, better not to say anything. We, and we don't need that information. It'll come out eventually. Well, I'm going to tell you one of the biggest things that I, I told Darlie Key this after the visit because I let her know how it went. And I, I told her, I says, I have never in my life, I said, I, I know people all over the globe. And I said, I have never in my life have met a woman that is as powerful and as strong as your daughter is. I said, I don't know wh how you raised her exactly, but you <laughs> definitely did something right. I said, because I have never seen such bravery. And... Um, um, I mean, she's, you know, always very appreciative of any nice remark like that. I just, cause I told Darlie, I, I said, you know, no matter whatever happens, I said, I'll continue to work on this case. She goes, she told me point blank. She goes, I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't care if they kill me tomorrow. She goes, cause I know where I'm going and I know who I'm going to be with. She goes, what I'm, what I want is justice for my boys. She goes, because I know I didn't do this and I want justice for my boys. And of course, she would want to see Drake again. Uh, she said that um, Drake recently wrote her a real nice letter and she got a real nice letter from uh, Drake's girlfriend as well. And I uh, said it was really cute. and She really enjoyed it. It, it really means a lot to her to, to hear from Drake and stuff like that. He hasn't so, visited. That's what I was going to ask you. Actually, wrote just wrote that down. If she has talked to Drake lately, so he doesn't visit her ever. Like, when's the last well, time she actually seen him? I, I don't. I don't know exactly when that has been. I do know that he lives in Colorado, um, and um, he's doing. He's doing very well. Okay, he's, he's, he's doing very well, and you know, so, you know, if you look at the facts of everything he went through, he had to grow up with his mother on death row. He got made fun of in school as a result of it. He um, had leukemia for quite some time. Um, he's really had a, a tough life, and um, I think he's come out very well from it, considering. So yeah, he's doing good. He's doing real good. And what about Darren? She does. She hasn't talked to him in probably a long, long time, huh? Yeah, years. 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 But you know, she really doesn't talk that ill of him. Believe it or not. So I mean, she doesn't. She doesn't like the idea of the shenanigans he was doing and you know stuff like that. But um, she really doesn't talk that ill of him. I thought it would be worse than it was, but it really wasn't. Um, I just think she's got bigger and better things to worry about. To be honest with you. And she knows, you know, that I I know everything pretty much, uh, you know, about all that. And, uh, you know, she told me, because I know you know this case. I've had people tell me things, because I know you know what happened. So, um, and it was nice to hear that, because I can't begin to tell you the 
endless hours that I've put in on this case. It, it's uh, I've put more time and hours and efforts on reinvestigating this case than any case I've investigated by like by times ten probably. So and you know it's it, it's funny. You know, I, I, I was reading a lot of the comments that from when I, I was on your program before and you know that you, you get a lot of good ones about me, you get a lot of bad ones about me. Um, you know, and I had to laugh, you know, people say, you know, I, I wasn't a part of, um, you know, that the uh, reinvestigation on the Kennedy assassination or, you know, John Benet Ramsey, stuff like that. You can ask Bonnie, you can ask Tara. Because I actually uh, sent her an email on. I actually had a detective from Colorado call me two weeks ago asking me for advice on a case, on the Candace Hiltz case, that I've been looking at for quite a few years. I suggest you look at that, by the way, Zab, the Candace Hiltz case. Candace uh, Hiltz, okay. Um, you're not going to get, you'll get a little bit off of uh, YouTube about it, but if you're real interested in the case, I could give you a lot of information that, that they're finally reinvestigating that case. And a detective was asking me for advice and I recorded the entire session. So, you know, people can say whatever they want. They don't know me. They don't know what I do. And it's okay. It's, I, wow, just, I didn't see those comments. Sorry. Sometimes I probably, no, no, have, okay. It's, it's not, no, no, no. I'm not upset about it. I, I'm just, it's going to happen. There are, and you know, Darley Key told me once, she said, you know, Rich, you're going to find that a lot of the non-supporters in this case are normally involved in law enforcement or some type of, you know, something in the criminal defense area or, or a government employee somewhere along the lines, because you're going to find that out real quick. She's exactly right. If you if you look at the the lady that was um, on there with you uh, with Kevin, I, I don't call her name now offhand, but um, she admitted that she had people with first degree murder convictions working with her were at her place of employment on your program. It just you know it just seems to be that way, and I'm not saying that all police are bad. I don't think that at all. I think there's some great detectives out there that do incredible work. I, this case in particular involved detectives that were extremely zealous, inexperienced, very conservative, that just didn't like Darley Lynn as a person. I think there's something deeper and darker to the whole thing. And the, the problem with it is the matter of proving it. But I promise you that's all being looked into as we speak. So, but anyway, I don't, I don't want to go too far off on a tangent. So I, I'd rather you ladies ask me questions than me throwing stuff out there. I think it would be better. <laughs> okay. No, yeah, I mean, the um, lady, law lady Joker has typed this comment up a few different times. So I think she really maybe wants you to answer this. Do you see it up there? Yeah. Do you yeah have blood, a blood, satur blood saturated the back of her teeth. I got to get put my glasses on. <clears throat> That old age thing's hitting me again. Here's <laughs> Blood saturated on the back of her T-shirt and on the pillow, on the couch. She must have been laying down when she was slashed. Yeah, I do a, I do a real interesting podcast. Uh, I know Bathsheba really, really enjoyed that one. Um, Stephanie Hopkins, which uh, she runs a, um, uh, a podcast on YouTube. It's called uh, Free Darley. <clears throat> Me and Stephanie know who one another is. Uh, she don't have a lot of communication with me because she was very upset at the fact that I had Brian St. John come on to my podcast. So as because I wanted Stephanie to come on my podcast because she has great insight onto the case and uh, she's very good friends with Darley. So I wanted her to come on and, and share things and she won't do it because I had Brian St. John come in my program and I, um, I'm a little, still a little bit be bewildered by that. No harm was meant with that. And, uh, Brian knew the rules from the get go that there was going to be no cutting up of that family or Darley Lynn or no disrespect cause I wouldn't have it. And he was more than happy to oblige by that. And, uh, and we debated the case with me and Brian and Tara for hours. And um, it was really a good podcast. And the some of the supporters didn't like that very much, that I did that. So it kind of kind of did a little damage to me. Um, but anyway, um, but back, back to the question. 
Um, anyway, I do a podcast on there. Darlie Lynn said that when she was on the couch, when Damon was touching her shoulder, she was laying on the couch and she was slightly to her left, her head. Which, if you look at the shirt that she was wearing, proves that to the tick. Why? Because all the blood saturation is on the back side, on the left side, which was the way she said she was laying. So the blood's going to run around, and it actually began to pool on the back side of her neck, and you can clearly see that on the shirt. Are you able to bring that shirt up on the uh, podcast, yeah. Ev? I think that would be that would be great because then I could give a, a real good. Actually, I I actually um, um, what's the word I want to use? I kind of um, did like a um, a, a, a reinstatement of the attack on Darlie Lynn of what I think really happened, and um, I actually did it with with Bonnie, and uh, I said, God, Bonnie, I said, if I put this on YouTube, somebody's going to end up calling the police on me or something, thinking I'm trying to kill you or something, you know. So I was almost a little bit, I, I'm a little bit skeptical about putting it on there, but I can explain it very well with the evidence. So, so and, you know, it's just like Stephanie Hopkins said, she goes, folks, it's called gravity. You know, what? You know, if you're laying down and you're slightly to the left, that's the way the blood's going to go. It's called gravity. And she actually, I, she actually puts a... Um, uh, the definition of gravity up on that podcast, just to kind of be smart about it, I guess. <laughs> so, but anyway. Um, I have, I'll bring up the ones that I bring up during the, and if there are better ones, let me know. But the ones that I usually bring up during the um, transcripts on that site, let me bring those up and let me know if there's actually um, better ones. This is the front. And then yeah, I that's think the front. Well, we can we can we, we can go back. Wait, wait. You can go back oh. to the front. Go back okay. to the front first okay. off. Okay. And now, here's what I want to point out to you. If you look at the top of the shirt, now you got to imagine this shirt being on Darley. Okay, where she was cut was the opposite side of the collar. So if she was laying slightly to her left, that blood's going to run around to the left side of the shirt and then down the back, which is clearly what happened here. Yeah, show us, you, Rich, you see. on you, like, show us on your collar, like, point to what you're saying so we get it. Okay, well, I think everything's backwards on these computers, like, like on the screens. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of hate that because I do, I do demonstrations on my podcast. I <laughs> look like an idiot. But Darlie Lynn was actually cut from here to about here, okay, on, on her neck. That's her neck wound. Now... If that being the case, if you're looking at the shirt here, where her neck was sliced would be, if you, and if this is looking at the shirt, the top left hand, where, where your pointer is there, Zev, that's where her neck was sliced. But look, there's not that much blood there. Mm -hmm. So she, and you got to remember she, her carotid artery, the, sh the, the covering, the, the sheath of the carotid artery is actually nicked. It was two millimeters away from cutting the carotid artery, which is about the thickness of a cigarette paper. So it's very minute. Wow. So she's bleeding like a stuffed pig, obviously. Now this, so the blood's going to run around. The blood did run around, mm -hmm. which is indication she was laying on her back and slightly to the left, not at the sink, standing up at the sink and doing the job on herself with, mind you, her left hand, which she would have had to do it with to make that kind of slice when her dominant hand was her right hand and her right hand, right arm had a stab wound all the way to the bone on it. And uh, But anyway, that's what I want to make note with that on the front of the shirt. Now, if you can get to the back of the shirt, Zab, we can do a little bit more. There it is. All right, now. So now the shirt's turned around, folks. Mm -hmm. The shirt's turned around. So again, the top left-hand collar, you can see where the blood actually ran around, started to pool a little bit, and literally start to run down her back. So this would have transpired at the time of the attack when her throat was slit until the time Damon started tapping her now that's a lot of blood that's true but you also have to understand i don't think darley was unconscious very long okay see it, it's very interesting to note too that she passed out again at the front door right you know so th this is from you know 
blood loss. You know, yeah, it, it's from point. it. Okay. Now, also, if we could make note here at the bottom of this shirt, you're going to see that right there, Zab, right there where you're headed. There's one mark there. Now I want you to go down a little bit down and to the right. Now you got another mark there. And if you if you match those marks up over, um, like, um, what's the word I want to use? Uh, here, I'll show you the material. If you get if you get these pictures, like if you get these and you put get the uh, the, the two different um, uh, knife wounds, or excuse me, the, the two different knife marks that you see on the shirt, and you put them together, they're identical. You know what that means? That shirt was folded up wet with blood on it. Oh, I see. And yeah. we've heard that that yeah. when the evidence was collected that it wasn't properly collected. No, it wasn't. They were actually putting, uh, um, and and Kevin's a bit misinformed on that as well. They were actually putting uh, different bits of evidence together that were bloody wet in the same bag, not in different bags. I actually, got, I actually have uh, uh, photographs of that. And um, it, it's just cross-contamination, pure and simple. Any of that evidence should have been thrown out of court, in my opinion, because it's invalid. And right. I just want to bring up real quick, because you, you mentioned the same thing I was commenting to somebody, because somebody said, she was a light sleeper, so she, she would have woke up. But I commented what you said. She probably wasn't sleeping. She was passed out from the blood loss. So she's probably like a deeper, you know, like just passed out when she was on the couch, like you just said. So... She wasn't like sleeping this light sleep. Well, I guess never mind. If he if they stabbed them first, though, never mind. Actually, that if they stabbed the kids first, then she would have been sleeping at the time. So never mind. I go back on that. Sorry. I was no, it, it it's it, it is it is really tough to figure it out. But what what's the word I want to? Yeah, I mean. Well, do you feel you like so? You feel like she stabbed both of the kids before the, they he stabbed her, right? Is that? No, I okay. I, I believe Darley Lynn was attacked first. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I believe okay. I believe that Darley Lynn was was the true target. And a lot of people think that. Well, it doesn't make sense if somebody just come in here and kill children. I agree with that. Right. Right. Okay. I believe Darley Lynn was the target. Darley Lynn was. Um, stirring up a lot of rattling a lot of cages around stuff with Darren. She's going to people's houses, going to people's places of business, demanding answers, being tough about it. These people were, some of them were really bad people and definitely capable of orchestrating something to this effect. Now I believe this, is what I believe, okay, that the intruder come into the house and, and, and I'm going to tell you, this is a, a, a very dangerous individual, obviously. This is somebody that if he if he hadn't done it before, he's going to do it again because he didn't blink an eye. And these people are very dangerous, obviously. Um, so, I, these, I mean, these are serious people. I mean, this is not, you know, just some, some random killing. I mean, this is, this is brutal. I believe the intruder come in and uh, initially attack Darley. You know, they may not been expecting those boys to be on the floor however i often wonder if kind of want to watch where i go with this but i think you ladies will figure it out i often wonder if um these people weren't told that darley lynn was going to be downstairs it makes you wonder i can't prove that but it makes you wonder now <clears throat> Darley Lynn gets attacked. I believe Devin woke up and Devin ran to his mother. Evidence kind of indicates that, which at that point, you know, but I also believe, and I told Darley Lynn this, I said, Who's ever, whoever did that has been in your house before. And she kind of looked at me funny and I said, yeah, I said, it's somebody you know. And I said, because how would they know to navigate that neighborhood so well. How would they know where the walkthroughs are in the alleyways? How would they know to get in and out of the neighborhood? And, you know, these types of people, they're going to want to know their exits. You know, they're not going to take anything a chance of getting caught. Now, 
I told her, I said, also, how would they know how to navigate? How would they know that window was going to be open? How did they know how to go from the garage to the utility room to the kitchen? Know where your knife block is. You got to mind. Remember, it's pitch black in there until you get to the Roman room where you have the glare from the TV. Now you're going to get into the Roman room, and um, you know you do the deed. You you stab the boys. You stab Darley Lynn. Now you know how to escape. Now you know how to get out of the neighborhood. Now. The sock, where the sock was found, Brian St. John did this test. I confirmed this. Te confirmed the test. If you put a sock on top of your vehicle and you race away from the back driveway of the Routier's house down the alleyway, driving kind of quick, the sock falls off almost in the same exact place where they found it. And... Brian St. John did the test. I confirmed the test as well. Two out of the three times, Brian St. John, the sock fell almost in the exact same place where they found it. And what's interesting to note is that when they had the dogs out there trying to smell for scents for people, the scent stopped the sock, which is further indication that somebody had left there in a vehicle. So I want to I wanted to point that one out. Um, so, uh, but I also I, I don't I don't know how well you you know Kevin Zavin. I don't mean any disrespect to him in any way. I want to make that clear. But um, you know I, I don't want to offend anybody or you know make anybody mad or disrespect anybody. But there there's just a lot of things that that need to be looked at. See, you know I. I live close to the Routier house. I've been there many times. I know that neighborhood very well. I've talked to a lot of people. I've re-examined pretty much everything in the case. And there is no question in my mind that she didn't do it. I was actually trying to find proof that she did do it for a long time. And I can't find any. I can't find any. There's no motive. There is no evidence First of all, and I'm going to tell you something. When, when I seen Darlie, first thing I looked at was her hands. She's got these tiny little hands. Uh, I mean, they are tiny. And I'm um, thinking to myself, you know, how in the world could they possibly think that a woman with that physique could actually, you know, be able to stab, you know, a, a six-year-old child through the heart through the breastplate, through the ribs, and the wound be five and three quarter inches, and then be able to pull it out. Do you understand when you stab a body, you know, it's not just, you know, a couple little taps. I mean, you got to go hard to go through a body like that, even of a child. It's not that simple, let alone multiple stab wounds to n not only Devin, but the Damon as well. A Damon's wounds, I think, are very interesting because the autopsy reports indicate that there were two separate weapons because the stab wounds are clearly different. So they talk about, well, they must have used the knife from the knife block. You ever think that maybe the reason why the stab wounds are different? Now, why they didn't use, you know, the intruder didn't use that weapon, who knows? It's hard to say. You know, when, you, when, you're, when you're pressed for time, which they clearly would be, it's just hard to say what could have happened or, or why they chose the knife out of the knife block. Anyway, I'm, I'm on a tangent again, Zev. Oh, that's interesting. So do you think there's, cause you had mentioned when you're talking about Dar talking to Darley, she used killers plural. So do you think there was two people? Is she thinking there was more than one person I should say that was in the house that day? Well, she didn't specifically state, but if you look at her regression ther therapy report, it indicates the possibility of two people. Okay. Um, other people have claimed maybe it was two people. I honestly don't know, um, but it, it it's possible. You have to remember, I mean, you know, if, if you're going to attack a 26-year-old woman, even if she's asleep, you know, she's not just going to lay there like some type of dummy doll. You know, she's going she's gonna to fight you. 
And when people are, you know, put in them uh, pandemonium situations, they get unimaginable strength and abilities. They really, because, you know, they get their adrenaline going, they start freaking out, um, which is, you know, clearly, I mean, if you look at the um, Darlie Lynn's um, photographs of her injuries, Clearly, there's evidence that there was there was some restraint to her to some way, shape, or form, and um, there's contusions on her arm, which indicates some type of scuffle. Yeah. Now, now, right. you ladies were talking with Kevin about the underwear that Darlie Lynn. Darlie Lynn wasn't wearing underwear that night. Okay. Um, I confirm that she okay. she wasn't wearing it. I don't I don't know why Darren said half the things he said. I have the feeling that Darren has a real good idea as to why this transpired and possibly mm -hmm. by who. And I believe, this is my own personal opinion, I can't prove it, but I believe that if he states the truth on the matter, he's going to get himself in a lot of trouble. He, yeah. even, he even admitted to, the, to that uh, one uh, reporter, Skips Hollingsworth, because, you know, I want to tell you the truth, but I don't want to end up where Darley is. Oh, you know, he I, said that. He said he didn't want to get railroaded like Darley did, oh, okay, and okay. end up end up oh. in in prison. So um, he he was involved in some bad stuff, Zab. He really was. Oh. Um, you know, and at the time, Darren was twenty nine years old. You know, he's still you know un, he's still a young man. But oh. I don't know. He had like some type of fascination with. Um, he just had an addictive mentality. He really oh. did. He really did. Uh, it's very, very sad, but I do believe that there are good things about him. Um, probably more so than I've ever had thought. But I mean, you got to remember. I mean, Darlie Lynn and Darren's marriage couldn't have been terrible the whole time. I mean, they had three children yeah. together. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I mean, you know, there there had to be you know some happiness there, which oh, yeah. she'll admit to that. But it was just you know during the last several months, everything started going under. You know, the, how many years were they married by the time it, she went to prison? Uh, they got married in 1988. As a matter of fact, Darlie Lynn had the same anniversary that me and my um, former wife had. So uh, eight years, okay. Yeah, from 1988 to 1995 or 1996. Yeah. But yeah, she went in uh, in uh, went to county in uh, the middle of June of '96. She's never been out. Uh, they got divorced. Um, I know it was 2011. I don't remember the month offhand. Something's telling me July, but I could be mistaken. Oh, well, I didn't realize. So he stayed with her. He stayed married to her that long before yeah. they got a divorce. Yeah. Yeah, from '96 to 2011. But yeah. it was um, it was a. Um, wow. I think well, Darlie Lynn wanted to get divorced long before that, but Darren didn't want to, and then finally he just said okay. Is it you know. because he found another woman, or is it was there another reason? Well, I, I know a couple things. I, I don't I don't really know if I want to put out there. Other than the <laughs> other than the fact that um, Darlie Lynn just Darlie Lynn said she'll always love Darren as father of her children, so on and so forth, but. She don't love, love him. She's not in love, love with him anymore. You know, she doesn't want to be in a marriage. She doesn't want to have him, nothing. Um, it, it's, it was never really indicated. He still fully, say, you know, supports her as far as saying she's innocent, but he doesn't have anything to do with her, though. He doesn't write her, visit her, call her. No, he just moved along. He's washed his hands of the whole thing. Oh, the whole um, thing. I've wanted to talk to Mr. Root here, and I told Darlie Lynn that. I, I said, you know, I, I thought about it. I said, I, I know where he lives, and I got his phone number, home number. I said, I know where his new business is out there in uh, Lubbock. And I said, I was thinking about going out there to see him. And Bonnie's like, well, you better hope you don't have a gun if you do that. And I said, you really think that? He would be that way. Bonnie thinks she does. He would be. And I asked Darlie Lynn, I said, what do you think would happen if I went? I said, I've never talked to Mr. Root here. But what do you think would happen if I went out there? And 
she didn't really answer me on it. She just kind of sat there and looked at me on it. So I don't know if uh, that'd be a real good idea or not. But what gets me with, with Darren, though, Darren has said over the years he would do anything in his power to get to the bottom of this case. But yet, when investigators like me and many others go to him to want to help, he doesn't want to talk to you. He doesn't want to have anything to do with you. Um, I mean, he told uh, Brian St. John to go F himself. Wow. Well, Brian St. John had made a remark to him because he he was doing he's doing really good. He's very wealthy. And uh, I don't know. I always found it interesting how he went from being in the hole, tens of thousands of dollars in the hole, and now he's a millionaire and you know that stuff just. Oh, I didn't know that he's a mill. I didn't know he was. Well, doing uh, he, okay. he he built a he built a house out there in Lubbock. Uh, it was worth I think like one point five million. Oh. In uh, Lubbock. Yeah, in wow. Lubbock. Uh, he owns a Netcom uh, out in Lubbock, and uh, he's got a big ranch. He has horses, and he's even got a helicopter pad out there. Wow, what? And, and, man! And you know, well, does so he right, put money on the books for Darley? And while well, Brian St. John asked him that, Brian St. John said, you know, Darren, you're doing so good. Why don't you help Darley out a little bit? You know, you think she's innocent. You know, send her a little bit of money, help her out. And he, he told him to go F himself. Oh, that's really? what he responded to. Wow. Yeah. Like, yeah. you think he would if he really did have that. I mean, it, it wouldn't take that much money to help her out. You know, just give her a little bit of money well, here and there. I mean, well, she's spending her life and, oh. Well, it, it yeah. I mean, it's not, not only that, but his children were butchered. Mm. You know, you, you would think that he would want to get to the bottom of that as to right. who did it. And he doesn't really seem to be putting any effort in or wanting to try to help. I mean, I know it's been 25 years, but so what? Justice hasn't been served. There's no statute of limitations on murder. Darren, I know you probably don't listen to YouTube, but if this gets to you, Darren, your mom thought Darley was innocent. Your family thought Darley was innocent, and these were your boys. So you really should not be washing your hands clean. You should be trying to get to the bottom of this and support Darley. Give her some money for her books. Well, I, I feel bad as well for, for Darren because, you know, you have to remember his life got shattered too. He, he, uh, he, he lost his wife. He lost two of his children. Um, you know, he pretty much had to start over from scratch again. So he's clearly also a victim, even if his actions did cause it. Um, you know, he's got to live with that. I wouldn't want to live with something like that, you know. And another one that I feel sorry for, uh, I feel sorry for all of them, quite yeah. frankly. But I'm being specific as far as individual. Uh, Dana, I feel horrible for. You know, oh, you gotta, my gosh. Yeah. Um, Darlie's sister, you guys in chat, that's who um, Dana is. She's the one that brought the silly string to the birthday party at the gravesite, right? Yeah. She's the one that left the window open because she was staying at uh, Darlie and Darren's house, and that night she wasn't. So she always smoked, right? Smoked at the window, so she left that window open. <laughs> and um, so for, and she was how old at the time? 15? She was 16. 16 so all of that you guys and the blame that her sister got over the silly string imagine the guilt on in the window to, i mean imagine i didn't realize she was that young wow when it happened Shoot. yeah yeah she was 16 and i think Whoa. um i think danelle was 13 or 14 at the time um I've never mm -hmm. talked to dana i've tried to talk to dana she doesn't want to talk to me about the case uh, she doesn't want to talk to anybody about the case. And mm -hmm. I, I guess I don't blame her. Um, does she talk to Darley still? Does she, does she have communication with Darley at least or no? No, not really. Oh, man. Right, they're, they're just, there's really no communication there. I, I don't want to go into that, okay. but I, there's just no communication there. But, okay. but with Dana, I, I do feel sorry for her because I, I, I know she loved her nephews and, uh, you know, at the time I know she loved Darlie Lynn and, uh, you know, but she had 
personal issues of her own going on at the time that were pretty serious. And, um, you know, and on top of it, you know, she, everybody always smoked in that window because Darlie and Darren, they, they didn't like cigarette smoke, you know? Mm -hmm. So if somebody smoked to come over to the house and went out to the garage and he smoked out that window. Um, so in the end, I just, I, but from what I understand, though, Dana's doing well. Uh, she's a registered nurse now. She just recently got remarried. She's doing pretty good, from what I understand. And uh, Danelle, Danelle's an incredible young woman, by the way. And I, Darley Lynn told me, she goes, Rich, if you want to know me, just know my sister, Danelle, because me and her are exactly alike. You know, she goes, Dana got the temper like my mother. She said, but me, me and Danelle are, <laughs> are a lot alike. And actually, um, Darley Key, she's an incredible woman. She really is, but she don't play games. You cross her, you mess with her, you're going to feel the fire real quick. And you guys in chat, if you don't know who Darley Key is, Darley Key is Darley Routier's mom. So they're both named Darley. And um, when we talk about Darley's mother, it will always be Darley Key. So that's how you know the difference. Yeah, they're... Uh, and uh, Danelle, I mean, she's a very family oriented woman. Uh, she's a registered nurse. Uh, she lives very close to Darley Key, and I'm glad she does because Darley Key is getting old. No, no offense, Darley, but it's true. And it's good that she's got somebody close by her there that can help her out. And then Danelle's a very helping out kind of person, kind of like Darley Lynn was. So Darley Lynn may be on to something with that. And uh, you got to remember that when. Um, Drake had leukemia. Danelle was by Drake's side night and day when he was getting his treatments and stuff and uh, cared for him the whole time during that process. Really did a, a spectacular job of Drake when he was ill with leukemia. So, and, and I asked Danelle if she would come on my program and she respectively said no. So, like I said, it's done its toll. Yeah, I, I mean, it has the ripple effects from any murder, but here's a really incredibly tragic, and if anyone doesn't know about this case, it is worth, even though it happened in 96, and you might think it's so long ago, right now we're dealing with a lot of child killers and child killing. Look at this case if you don't know about it, and it's hotly debated today. We're going to be talking on Monday. I don't know if you saw this, Rich. On Monday, we're going to be talking to Peter Hyatt, who is a statement analyst, and he's going to look at the 911 call. So if anyone isn't hasn't gotten into this case, this is a good time. We've done, I don't know how many episodes of transcripts. Yeah, a lot. Uh, Rich has um his channel it's, yeah put mods put rich's channel up in the um in the chat if you don't mind yeah and uh rich goes too, into the case very in depth and obviously he just visited with darley you know there's covid restrictions and nobody could visit darley on death row and he went what was it three weeks ago now uh Two weeks. Yeah, two two weeks. Yeah, two weeks ago, and I, I'll be going again in August. So I really look forward to that. And so it's it. This is an amazingly complicated case with a lot of opinions around it, and it's a good time to get into it because there's things happening. Uh, there's the Innocence Project took it on. She's on her last appeal. Um, she's on death row in Texas, and for. Everyone, I think Texas is, is notorious, their death row. Um, so it's, you know, a good time to get into it for those of you that might not know about her case. You know, I, I thought that it would be a little harder for, for me than it was when I left the prison, just knowing I was, you know, leaving and she had to be in that godforsaken place. And, but the, you know, her mentality and her kindness and her, uh, your giddiness, if you will, of talking with her, it wasn't that difficult at all. And I thought it would be for me because I, I'm, you know, I don't, I don't want to see anybody innocent, you know, yeah, you know, sitting on death row like that. That's awful. 
I couldn't imagine something like that. And for somebody who's been in there for 25 years like that, I would have killed myself 20 years ago. I'm going to be honest with you. I told her that too. I said, I, I don't, I said, you're, you're amazing. I said, I, I don't know how you do it. Um, so, but you know, a lot of people don't, you know, they just hear stuff about Darlie on these documentaries on, um, uh, you know, things that people have to say, half of it's not even true. And, you know, when you really, when you really meet the person and you talk to her, you're going to figure it out real quick. She's not all that much different from any average friend that you might have that functions very well in society. She really isn't that much different. Now, um, another thing that we talked about, and, and I want to bring this up because I, I see a lot of comments to the good and to the bad uh, in here today is, you know, at the Silly String uh, interview and at the singing the happy birthday thing at the Silly String, you know, at that time, Darlie Lynn was looned up on a lot of medication that she was uh, discharged with from the hospital. And I actually have uh, the report on that. You know, she was on, uh, they had prescribed her Xanax. They had prescribed her Laura tabs, which is also known as Vicodin. She was also prescribed um, uh, Darvacet. Was it? I think it was Ooh. Darvacet, which they took that off the market because that yeah. stuff makes you. Yeah, they took that. Yeah. Um, and uh, she was also on an antibiotic called Augmentin, um, which I, I don't want to be graphic, but that that medication is is known to make you run to the bathroom about every twenty minutes. But uh, there, she was probably given the antibiotic for um, my guess would be for uh, infection prevention from the stab wounds that she had. So, um, and it was eight days after, right? Yeah, the birthday yeah, the, party. The birthday at the gravesite was eight days after the murders, and and she was still on that medication. I, I checked on that. So, and you know what? I have six herniated discs in my back. I have a muscle atrophy in my legs from it. I have a I have very serious back problems. So, I don't anymore. But many years ago, I took a lot of those medications for pain. And I'm glad I got away from it because that, that stuff is nasty, boy. It is really hard to get off of it once you're on it as well. And um, it, it, may, it changes you. It really does. It changes your mentality, how you communicate, how you react to things. I know it for a fact. So I can, and you know, if, if you look at her, at the Silly String video and at the interview, she does look a little ditzy, if you will. You know, just kind of the way she's walking around and, you know, her expressions and the things she's saying at that interview. Folks, I'm here to tell you those medications do that. I know it for a fact because I've been on them. They just make you like that, you know. Um, like but, numbed out, detached. Yeah, you're just not, you're just like a, almost, you're a well-aware zombie, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. You know, you're, you're just not... Uh, you're just not your true self, clearly, you know, so, um, but, you know, speaking with her today, the way she was talking to me really wasn't all that much different than the way she was talking at, you know, some of the interviews that are broadcasted on YouTube, um, pretty much the same. She got a real kick out of the story. Uh, that I told her about what had occurred. Her her mother, Darlie Key, had, had put on Facebook a quiz to see how well you knew Darlie Key. So I took the quiz, and I got four out of the ten right. I think it was four out of the ten, which I, I thought was pretty bad. And I wrote Darlie Key. I said, well, at least I got four right. I said, Rich, don't worry about it. My ex-boyfriend, you got more right than my ex-boyfriend got, you know. <laughs> and, and so I told Darlie Lynn about that. She got a kick out of it. Um, and she, she's got a very good sense of humor. She really does. So, um, for me, I, I would never have a good sense of humor if I was in, in a situation like that. You're talking about an upper class woman that went from that to death row. It's unimaginable what, what it, what it had to do to her, but yet she still s stays very optimistic and strong to this day. So it's really amazing. I've never seen anything like it.
not even close. Yeah. So what else when you went to see her, because I know it was just an hour long visit and you did talk about gardening a lot of it because she likes gardening and you do too, right? Oh, yeah. So what else can you share with us that she said? I know when I listen to yours and you guys in chat um, after we're done here, Rich on his channel, if you've subbed or and you checked out, uh, Zav dropped the link. And yeah, I'll drop it again, actually, too. We can pin it. it. Can oh, pin yeah, it? let's pin it. Yeah, we'll good it idea. Then, okay, I'll pin you it. You guys ahead. can go check that out. And then um, he talks about this. He talks about his visit um, with her. So what can you, because I know you said there were some things you couldn't share, but she, like, would give a look, and it kind you kind of took it a certain way because there were guards listening. So can you can you share anything else with us that some of the questions that – your viewers asked and you asked her about um you know you know and i you know most of the stuff i wanted to ask her you know zav hit the nail on the head when she said you know if i went in there i'd probably forget almost everything mm -hmm. and i and i did um except for um the real important questions that i've been wanting to ask her for a long long time um i could I think that to some of the questions that I had for her, I don't know this for a fact, but I think she has the answers to it, but she didn't want to tell me. I don't know if it's because of the specific guard that was there or because there's this new investigation. She doesn't want the information to get out, um, just stuff like that. It, I, I think that's why, um, because there, there was one thing that's kind of personal that I was talking with her about, and she wouldn't, she wouldn't even go there. She immediately changed the subject, and it has nothing to do with the case. It has something to do with somebody she knows, and um, immediately just changed the subject, and mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't, wouldn't touch it. So, there are, you know, some questions that I asked she didn't want to go to, but. Um, not because she was trying to hide something, because you know she'd kind of get a give a motion with her eyes toward the air, way the guards where the guards were, and I, I knew what she was trying to tell me. So I just didn't go any further, you know, into that question. But um, I know she's very optimistic for the future. Uh, she said um, she goes this this stuff just takes so long. She goes I'm just uh, she goes I'm getting tired, Rich. And I, I said, well, I can't even begin to imagine how tired you are. I said, listen, I said, you got to keep fighting, darling, because if you don't, they're just going to do it to somebody else. So um, and she agreed with me on that. She also agreed with me about the killer probably knowing who they are and has been in the house before. She agreed with me because she told me, she said that her house, her and Darren, uh, gave the builders the design to build that house. And she said, you know, it's funny because initially there wasn't going to be those kind of windows that went into the garage. And me and Darren specified that we wanted those types of windows put into the garage on the house. We told them to do it that way because there's not many houses that have windows like that. So, and she's exactly right. If you look at the, the videos on it, the windows are very low to the ground and they're very large. Okay. Now, I mean, you can, you know, if there's no screen in there, you can literally slip in there without touching a thing, without touching a thing. Darren actually did the uh, test himself. And also to let you ladies know, when you're talking about the sock and with people running down to the alleyway and then running back, it takes 26 seconds to run. This is running full blast, mind you. Okay. It takes 26 seconds to run from the murder scene to where the sock was found. And then you got 26 seconds to run back. It's 75 yards. Mm -hmm. So that'll give you a little bit better outlook on the, um, on the timeline. And a lot of the non-supporters will say there is no timeline. And I still don't understand what planet they're on because there, there is, there's always a timeline. To any murder, there's always a timeline. And there is a timeline clearly in this case. So 
just for for oh that's short that's quicker than i thought okay 26 seconds that's not long at all then okay the 20, wow. yeah 26 seconds one way no you're almost you almost got a minute in itself and this is running full blast okay mm -hmm. and, and actually darren did the test so let's say darley lynn did do it well darley lynn probably couldn't move and run as fast as darren could so it probably would have even taken her longer. So it's 26 seconds. So um, that would, that's, that's almost, that's, so let's see, that would be, um, <coughs> excuse me, that'd be, that'd be 52 seconds, right? So you're, you're talking almost a minute. So that, that's already one minute chewed out of the timeline before anything else. So now you, you, you got one minute there, and then you're going to run into the house. Now we're, we're going to suddenly decide to stab Damon, right? After Devin's already dead, we're going to stab Damon, right? Well, don't you think Damon would have been woken up by Darley Lynn getting attacked and stabbed as well as Devin, just like Devin woke up and probably ran to his mother? And also, now think about this a minute. So now Damon's just going to sit there and just wait for his mom to come back to stab him six times in the back. It doesn't make any sense. You well, know? what if I know some people, I think some people would argue that he was stabbed a few times first and then the last couple stabs was when she came back. I've heard that. Well, that theory, a, a lot so of, I don't... a lot of times they say that because the knife wounds to his back are different which is an indication that it, a different weapon was used. That doesn't necessarily mean that it was done at a different time. Not necessarily, okay? <laughs> but but it, does it does, you know, create questions. And then That's there was no, sure. Damon's blood wasn't even on that knife, right? If I'm, no, Devin's blood wasn't even that, on that knife, right? That is correct. So that's, Devin's that's showing that there's probably a different weapon too, right? That there's well, two? Well, that's true, but they also only, at the time, in 1996, they only, they only did a five-point check on that knife. Um, in other words, they just checked five different points on the knife. So they didn't analyze the, the entire knife. Um, and out of those five points, they only found uh, blood that belonged okay. to Darley and Devin. Um, but, it, but it's very interesting, clearly. Wow. Um, so, and as far as um, I, I don't, I don't know if I can say this, so I better not. Yeah, so. I don't say anything that's going to jeopardize. You <laughs> so, know, yeah. Oh, I, I, I will, I wouldn't. Blake, I could probably say a little bit more than I say, but I, I just don't. Yeah, it's better it's to. Not, it's not worth it. On the safe um, side. But um, I told Darla Lynn, I said, "We got to get you out of here, and then when you get out of here, where I want to get you on my podcast." And you can just, <laughs> You can have a good old time with the yeah. hair. Wow. Can you imagine that? Coming that uh, out of there, it would be like but, shell shock. <laughs> well, Zab, I did tell her um, a, a lot about your podcast and how great you've been doing on here. Oh, she did want me to tell you, ladies. She wanted um, me to send you her love to you guys. Aww. I told her how great how great of a job you've been doing. And I said, you've been very fair. You don't take sides. You you know, you're looking at both sides of the case. Darla Lynn totally agrees with that. She thinks that's what people really need to do. She goes, because when you come to the end of the road, you're going to see that she didn't do it, hmm. uh, which is the, clearly the same road I ran into. But, you know, on both sides of the aisle here, you're going to run across some crazy people whether it be on a support side and a non-support side. Uh, you know, on the non-support side, um, you know, Joe Douglas, I've heard you ladies mention her name before. I know Joe very well. She's actually a cousin to uh, Eileen Warnos. Whoa. And who wow. is she? I don't yeah, remember. Yeah. I um, remember she, yeah, I've seen her. I definitely do oh, remember her, yeah. Oh, yeah, I, Eileen uh, Warnos. Uh, she Whoa. Definitely a couple cans short of a six-pack. But anyway, <laughs> she, um, it, very sad, though. Uh, that whole story with Eileen Warnos is extremely. Oh, Joe Douglas. Sorry. I'm sorry I had an epiphany of who that is. Yeah. I, well, Maybe she's I, here today. I've, <laughs> had, I've had many conversations with her over the telephone. And many conversations with Joe. With Joe. Oh, okay. Um, and we got to know one another very well. 
And you know what? I'm, I'm not going to lie about it. I don't lie about anything when I come on these podcasts because that destroys your credibility. So I'm just going to be totally honest with you. She knows a lot about the case. She cleared. She really does. But she also makes up a lot of stuff about the case that she can't prove. Oh. And, um, and Brian St. John refers to her as delusional. And in some cases, she might be. Um, we actually, uh, we got along really well for a while, but uh, she is, she, I don't want to put words in her mouth. I personally believe she's a man hater and that, that's okay if you are. Uh, I don't care about that. That's your, that's your choice. But she's been hell bent on, you know, claiming that she can prove that Darren murdered those boys and she starts to make stuff up that just, isn't true that didn't happen things that you can't prove and it it's uh it's it's not good to do that it's just not good to do that so and if you get her mad she starts acting like eileen warnos so oh. Whoa. Uh, no dis, no disrespect man but it's oh. the truth Oh no! So That's I would, <laughs> but um, I know she's written Darley. Darley wouldn't respond to her. Uh, the, she says absolutely horrible stuff about Darley Key and Dana and stuff. And I, you know, I told her oh, one time. Yeah. I said, I said, you know, I I know Darley Key. She's a friend of mine. I said, I don't really like some of the stuff that you're saying because I have never gotten any of those indicate. You know, she makes the, she's, I mean, she says some horrible stuff about Darlie Key, stating, oh, her and Darren had an affair. And, and I, that's a hell of an allegation to make. And, um, and I've never seen any proof of anything like that. Darlie Key tried to help Darren a lot after the, the murders occurred because Darren wouldn't stay in the house after that. And uh, Darley Lynn could blame him. That's that would yeah. be so horrible. So they uh, weren't they weren't staying at the house after that. Neither one of them were up until Darley got arrested. Of course, it was also a crime scene, so they probably couldn't stay there anyway. Mm -hmm. But so they were staying with Darley Key. Darley Key was helping them out in any way that they could, any way she could, until and then once Darley Lynn did go to prison, he remained staying with Darley Key until he got on his feet again. And then uh, eventually he went back to Lubbock with uh, with Drake, but she, you know, uh, there for a while, you know, they couldn't really, they had, to, you know, that I mean, the, you know, CPS come and took Drake away from Darley Key and Darren because um, they they went to they went right to the house. They said uh, we're we're here to take Drake Routier and Darley Key said you're not taking Drake. We didn't do anything wrong. She goes, they said, well you believe that Darlie Lynn is innocent. And so we can't guarantee that you're going to protect him if, wow. if she happens to get out on bail. And so and Darlie Key goes, you know what? My daughter is innocent until proven guilty. Or did you people change it now? You know, wow. and yeah, Dar Darlie Lynn don't, or excuse me, Darlie Key don't play when she's upset and rightly so I wouldn't either. She's tough. And, uh, I, I've always told her, and I always told Darley Lynn, I said, you know, I'm glad me and your mom are in the same corner because I wouldn't want to be on the opposite side. You know, so she, she's a fighter boy, let me tell you. Uh, meaning that in, in a good, good yeah, sense. Yeah. So how long did they take Drake? I mean, how long was Drake uh, taken away from? Uh, well, not not real long because Cyrilla Routier actually worked for the CPS as well. So, you know, she was really? able yeah. So yeah. that okay. So Cyril, that you guys in chat is Darren's mom. That is she correct. Worked for CPS. Yes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, and she uh, and she was an avid supporter of Darley Lynn. Avid yes. supporter. Um, and and yeah, that's that's tell it should tell you something, especially when a mother-in-law, you know, under all these circumstances, are are saying, "I know my daughter-in-law didn't do this." You know, I know my daughter-in-law didn't do this. And until and, and sadly, she died. Um, uh, I believe it was last December. Sadly, um, she was very, very sick for a long time. But all the way to her dying day, she said Darlie Lynn was innocent. And um, you know, me and Darlie Lynn actually talked about that a little bit. And she said that um, she goes, you know, she goes, I, I'm just glad that 
you know, all the way up to the end. She knew that I loved her and I still love her. And uh, I'm just glad that she knew that I did, and you know, for all the wonderful things she's always done for me, you know. So, you know, sad, but it was it, it was a, a pleasant thing to hear. It's Rhoda Rutier, really a nice woman, or she was mm -hmm. rather, um, a, a, a God fearing woman, very much so. So, and a, a very good um, communicator as well. She could really hold on a good conversation with conviction okay. wow. so but but yeah she was a um uh she she worked for cps but we got to make it clear though um it wasn't it wasn't like the same department that sirota worked in it's it wasn't the same exact department that took drake away i want to make uh, that clear okay yeah yeah so you don't want to get that confused but um anyway yeah, Anna Annie Oakley says, um, Rich, I just lost it. Um, Rich, Cyrilda was a CASA volunteer. Those are court-appointed child advocates. Yeah, yeah, they. Yeah, that's what I said. They were they were in different departments, but she worked mm -hmm. in that department. But she wow. got temporary custody of Drake. Cyrilda did. Oh, and, so Cyrilda's the one that got, wow. Okay. Yeah, and then... Um, and, and Darren was awarded visitations. And then, you know, eventually as years went by, Darren eventually got Drake. So, oh. And, you know, I'm going to hmm. tell you, you know, people, you know, speak very highly on, um, you know, how well of a job Darren did raising Drake. And I've heard that from many people. Even Darley Key says that. Um, you know, and... Um, Darlie Key told me, she goes, you know, a lot of people say things, and I know some things, she goes, but I will never, ever believe that Darren murdered those boys unless he were to tell me he did it himself. I will never believe that. She goes, there's no way that he would want to physically hurt, you know, those boys or Darlie. I just, she said, I just don't believe that. Wow. Wait, she who goes, said that? Darlie Key? Is that what Dar you said? Okay. Darlie Key told me that. She okay. told me that over the phone, and I know she uh, she has said similar things to that on, on uh, documentaries and interviews. So, um, and believe me, let, let me tell you something about Darlie Key. If she had any reservations on that, she'd say it. Absolutely. Believe me that. when I tell you. Um, it, she doesn't, uh, she doesn't. And, and if Darlie Key's watching, no disrespect, man, you, you know, I think the world of you, but she don't have much of a filter on her mouth. So I don't either, to be honest with you. If I'm mad and very passionate about something, I'm, I'm going to take off with it, you know. So me and her, we, we definitely fit on that aspect, clearly. So. Let me clear something up because people are confused in chat. No, we're not. We didn't say that Darley was Eileen Warno's cousins. We we're talking about <laughs> <laughs> this is how things get like. Oh, um, we we're talking about um some some person that comes in our chats that Rich is actually talks to on the phone. I guess um she, she well not anymore. Really okay, so she's been in my chat a lot. Um, so he's talking about her, not Darley. So just make sure you guys are. Yeah, D D I, Darlie Lynn has no relation to Eileen Warnos. So. I know, that would be like breaking news, right? Next oh. thing we see. Oh my God. If, if, that, if, if that had been the case, I'd have to do another investigation from yeah. start to finish. <laughs> that, I, you know, and I, I'm, I, you know, you, you really truly have to feel bad for, for Eileen because she was clearly mentally ill. She never received any of the treatment that she probably should have been receiving over the years. You know, her father was clearly a head case as well. She probably inherited that trait. So it's not even really her fault. Her grandfather was extremely abusive to her. Um, you know, her and her brother had sexual relations. I mean, the abuse started at, when she was a very young girl through adulthood. And as a result of so many men being so awful to her, um, she, be, you know, she hated men just in general. And then lo and behold, she becomes a prostitute and prostitutes mm -hmm. are usually treated very, very poorly. And now she's being, you know, abused by them. 
and she just went off the deep end and started capping off these people that were buying her. She's pressed to one by one by one. Yeah. And, um, you know, eventually they got her. And by the time they, you know, they got her incarcerated, I have never seen such a disturbed individual. And uh, of course, you know, I'm, I'm a, I don't believe in the death penalty. I used to, I don't believe in a death penalty anymore because of the Darley case. But, um, Clearly, I don't think she should have been executed, although she wanted to be executed. She said that if she wasn't executed, she'd kill again. She knew she'd kill again. She needed to be executed. But um, she clearly needed extreme serious psychological help from a very young age and just clearly never got it. Very unfortunate. You know, and, uh, and as a result of that, Many people were murdered, and then she was also sent to death, let alone, and I think, so you got those people that she murdered, now you got the victims of all their families as well. You know, it causes for a very disturbing society, sadly. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Um, I don't know. Bella, do you have anything else to ask? Um, does any no, of chat have... What? I, wanted, I wanted to reiterate that Darley had a you know um regression therapy about the regression therapy and because yeah. we didn't know that until well i didn't know that until we started getting into the transcripts and uh i just wanted to like have rich just talk about that they try to do they got one session of regression therapy in and then they tried to go back to do more and they were denied they were kept waiting but the regression therapy has a lot of info on it and we we touched on it a little zav yeah. rich did you i think you did a whole like show on it oh right? yeah oh yeah so the you guys if this is important about like how did she sleep through the attack because in the beginning when all this happened i thought in 96 i thought for sure darley was guilty okay because i saw her clacking her gum spraying the silly string at the gravesite. And I was like, I was, you know, obviously I was also younger, and, but that was the image that I thought. And then when I looked into the case a little bit more, I was like, how does somebody sleep, right? Like it, whether or not they're like, well, their kids are getting killed and they're getting stabbed. Like, how do they sleep through that? But this regression therapy kind of answers that. So Rich, can you tell us a little bit about that? I, I would be happy to. Hey, Bonnie, can you hand me the regression therapy report out of the Darley file, please? I, I can't reach it from here. Um, you know, it's it's funny you were talking be, before. While Bonnie's looking for that, I do want to tell you something about the gum chewing ordeal. You know, mm -hmm. Darley Lynn wasn't much of a gum chewer. You know why she was chewing gum that day? Mm -mm. Because the inside of her mouth was all tore up as a result of the attack, and her mouth was real dry and irritated and she was chewing gum to kind of keep her mouth moist not just that uh xanax which she was prescribed that medication would give you dry mouth real bad that's why she was actually chewing gum she wasn't much of a gum chewer and if you notice when she was giving the interview to the news reporter she wasn't chewing gum then mm -hmm. so that was something i wanted to throw out there and um bonnie's gonna pull up that report for me yeah, let me see it. I think that is. And uh, you guys, yes. the inside of her mouth, it, this wasn't brought up. And, and this is something her defense attorney should have brought up a little bit more and made a big point of. The inside of her mouth, because what's believed, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the sock that was found, you know, whatever, several yards away, had her saliva on it. It was saliva DNA, right? Well, it, they did find her DNA, but in the report, they can't determine as to whether or not it was skin cells or saliva. Oh, okay. So, so okay. they didn't even fully examine it. And with, as far as the fiber in the window is concerned, there, there's something new on that that I can't share, but here's what I'm going to share about it. They didn't even do a full examination on that fiber that they found in the window to prove that it come from the screen. Even the person that they had do that, do the testing on it said further testing was necessary to confirm it the testing was available in 1996 but they just chose not to do it 
and just mm -hmm. as, assume that that's where that particular fiber came from. Now, if that isn't shoddy investigation work, I don't know what is. You're talking about a double homicide and an attempt, attempted homicide here. And um, that's On how we- On a death that's penalty. How, this is a death penalty case. So it's a capital murder I, you would case. think you wouldn't, these are things that need to be looked into. You can't just go into a death penalty case and go, mm, we're not going to test. We're not going to test that part of it. Or we're just going to do the first test. We're not going to bother with the second test. These are things that scream for a new trial. And again, you guys, if you don't, if you've never listened to us before, um, Zav and I, I'm not saying Darlie is innocent. I don't know what Darlie is. I'm just trying to figure out and the justice and get justice for the boys. And if she is innocent, it's a travesty. I don't know. I haven't made up my mind about it. I think Zav, where are you in that? You on Darlie's guilt or innocence? Where do you, where do you stand with that at this moment right now? Thank you, Melissa. C. Are you talking to me? Yes. To you. Oh, I thought you were, I didn't know who you were asking. Sorry. Um, um, well, shoot. I'd be careful with that response. Yeah. I know. I, I don't know. It, I'm just, I just want to continue learning a little bit more. I don't know. Um, and that's exactly the best way to be because I'll be honest with you. Even if you take a side, if the minute you broadcast it, you're going to get attacks from one side or the other, <laughs> like you wouldn't believe. It's you, you ladies have done yeah. spectacular concealing that, even though you even said you know you'd like to look at it more, which is definitely the best thing to do. But don't, I, I wouldn't do that if I were you. It's up to you, of course, <laughs> yeah. but you'd just be ready for attacks. So now, the first thing I want to show you, ladies, on this is the entire uh, report on the regression therapy. Now, first off, I want to show you, let me see if I can get it on the screen right here. These are the, I think I'm getting it up there. These are the signatures of the psychologist and the psychiatrist that perform the test. They put their signature on it, who they are, and what their degree is in psychology and psychiatry. And one of them was actually a leading psychiatrist for the FBI at the time. So I want to make that clear, okay? So what would you like to know about the regression therapy report, Bella? Like just kind of a really quick synopsis of she got regression therapy and what was said, you know, like just, I know it's a little bit long, but. Um, actually, it's not too bad. A lot was said, actually. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, let, let me tell you folks this. When she was released from Baylor University Hospital, this was the exact medication and dosages she was given. She was given Augmentin, 875 milligrams, one tablet by mouth, three times a day at 8 a.m., 1 p.m., 4 p.m. for five days. So she would have been off that at the time of the Silly String episode. Now, she was also prescribed five milligrams of Loratab, which is also known as hydrocodone or Vicodin today. It, it, she was get, uh, the prescription reads one to two pills by mouth every four to six hours as needed for pain. She was also given a prescription for Xanax. Now, a lot of the non-supporters state that she was on a 2.5, or excuse me, 0 0.25 prescription. That's mm. wrong. She was on a 0.75 prescription, which is actually a much higher dose for Xanax. And she was given that one tablet by mouth every eight hours as needed for anxiety. She was also given Darvacet N100, one tablet by mouth every four hours as needed with the hydrocodone, with the Xanax. Wow, okay? wow, wow. Now, this information that doesn't look very clear is all right there. Yes. And it's also on your channel. Yes. Yes, and absolutely. And that channel is pinned. You guys, on the pin that we have in chat, that is Rich's channel. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Oh, am I on mute? No, I'm not on mute. <laughs> yeah, we're going to, me and Tara and um, uh, one of Darlie Lynn's personal friends, we're actually going to take, uh, and I uh, asked Bathsheba to join us as well. We're going to take a real big deep dive into some of the blood evidence again coming up here. So um, just some other stuff that we didn't, 
uh, put on the program from before we're going to be going into. And Zab, I want you and Bella to come on the show. Yes. Um, when are you doing this, did you say? I, well, I, I try to do them every Sunday, but sometimes okay. it don't pan out. Um, but I can, I, I'd love for you ladies to come on. We can also, I'd like to advertise your podcast as well to my viewers because you've been so kind to me with that. Plus, I think a lot of my viewers would really enjoy a lot of the materials that you have and that you share on here. I know the, the people that I, that go come to my podcast to go to your podcast as well. They love your podcast. So, um, it, it, it'd be a, a good opportunity for you ladies too to maybe get some more, uh, viewers. Plus I think you ladies are very smart and, and you, you, you ask some really, really good questions uh, on the case. I think you'd really be good coming in there. So Zab, what I'll do, um, we're going to, we're going to do a deep dive on that, um, on a blood analysis, me, Tara mm -hmm. and, uh, Bathsheba and one of Darlie Lynn's personal, uh, uh, friends, practically family. And then after that, um, I'd love to have you ladies come in. Okay. We would love that, right? Yeah, uh, yeah that'd yeah. be great. That would be great. So, Zeb, I'll send you an email when we can do that. Okay, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay, let's see. Now, as far as, now on the assessment that the psychiatrist and the psychologist made are follow as quote, uh, the assessment is that the patient meets the diagnostic criteria for the DSM IV. Okay, so basically what that is is like a truth serum or like a sodium pentothal, if you will. Mm -hmm. What they do is they do they, they did like a, a psychiatric evaluation of Darley just to make sure that she had the upper faculties, if you will, to be able to do the test on an accurate basis. And it says here that she meets the requirements. Okay. Uh -huh. All right, now, on um, axis one on the assessment, they do believe that she suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, which isn't very hard for me to believe at all. On axis two, there's no other psychological diagnoses. On axis three, there were physical scars on numerous areas of the patient's body caused by stab wounds experienced by a traumatic event, which Darley Lynn showed me those scars, which are still vividly obvious uh, today when I visited her at prison. On access four, it says there's problems with primary support group to include the death of the patient's sons, disruption of the family by separation and her incarceration, removal from her home and separation from her husband and youngest remaining child, mother and other family members to include being denied the communication of touch with them. Problems related to the social environment centered around her incarceration, very limited and educational opportunities, forced occupation with difficult work conditions with no remunerization, which I'm not sure what that means, to be honest with you. Housing problems centered around her incarceration and economic problems with inadequate finances, not only of her son, but of her family caused by overwhelming legal expenses. So these were the things that were occurring. And this test was done. Let me give you the date on this. I think I might have done that on your other podcast. I had a hell of a time finding it then, and I'm having the same problem now. I know it's on here. I just got to find it. I thought it was here. Yes, uh, it was done at 2 p.m. on Friday, October 10th of 1997. So Darlie Lynn would have already have been on death row. So... <clears throat> This was their conclusions. And Bella, am I touching on the stuff you want me to touch on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and she, you know, she did, I, I think you might be getting into this, but she did have, when they went into the regression there, you know, she, it didn't play out kind of the way we know it, what she saw happening. Right. 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 And here, here was the uh, results of the test. Okay. Perfect. All right, here we go, folks. Darley reports, and this is what, um, this is after she was sedated, if you will, and she was given the test by, by two applicable physicians. 
It says, Darley reports that she had fallen asleep on the couch in the living room with her two boys sleeping on the floor. The lights were off except for the light from the big screen TV in the living room. Darley reports that she had woke and had trouble breathing as if someone was blocking her airflow. She also felt pressure and pain on her legs. Hold on one second. This print is so small, my glasses don't even work on it. <laughs> Something was blocking her airflow. She also felt pressure and pain on her legs with the pressure holding her down. She reports that she saw two men, but not anyone she knew. One man who was on and over her was described as big and very black and very dark. The other man she could not see clearly because of the lack of light, but felt that he was probably not white because he seemed darker than a white man. The other man, she reports seeing bending over Devin and holding him down when Devin was trying to come to her, which is also what I believe happened, and the crime scene evidence, excuse me, indicates that. Darla reports that she was trying to get away. In her struggle, she fell off the couch onto Damon, who was asleep on the floor next to the couch. She reports Damon awoke when she felt on him, fell on him. The man, and that would also indicate why the glass table was tipped over. You know, like Greg Davis said that the crime scene was staged. And I always found it interesting they say that. Well, why are you going to stage a crime scene and then not use the stage? which she never did. The man was trying to pull her up and he began stabbing at Damon and Darley and try and Darley tried to stop him, but could not. Darley was pulled back onto the couch and felt pain in her groin feeling. It might be possibly his knee and the pressure on her chest feeling. It might be his head. She remembers the man making noises, but does not know what the other, what other than he said, quote, unquote, shut up, bitch. She reports that the man smelled of smoke and had lots of small braids. He had a cap on his head with, with the brim forward. The only other sound Darley reported during this session that she heard was glass breaking, but she could not be sure where. But she felt that it might be in the living room. At this point, we ran out of time, and the hypnosis session was ended. Very interesting. Very interesting. It kind of, that kind of matches more with the crime scene. I totally and agree. Everything else. But I, and there was no attention given to that. So then tell us, they went back, so the, the notes also say, but these therapists went back to continue because you know they were just getting on with it like how would they have only an hour two hours with the ther regression therapy uh let's see here give me one second I, I, can, I can tell you this it's in the report i think i know but i don't want to guess and put out false information i said it was right. about this time the guards had informed us that our time was up when it was then approximately 1 p.m., we informed them that by a letter we had been granted time from 9 a.m. until noon or later if necessary, and that Darley had not been available to us until after nine or after 10:15. So that means she got shorted on time by an hour and 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. They indicated that they would call the warden at this time for a decision. Shortly thereafter, we're, we're afterward, the warden extended our time until 1.30 p.m. Other than restroom breaks, we consume the rest of the remaining time and continuously reviewing the information that Darley produced under hypnosis. We also agreed that we would con conduct further clinical sessions if and when that was possible. We agreed to keep in touch. The following interview, we later were available to contact Darley's mother, Mrs. Key, and arrange the time within the next day or so when we could have a conference call to discuss the session with Darley. This, of course, was with Darley Lynn's permission, though it has been agreed between the patient, her mother, Dr. Logan, and that I would be probably 
pursue further sessions with Darley. No specific appointments have been made yet as this time. And this entire report is signed by Dr. Nancy Logan and Richard Garver. And Richard Garver actually was a um, an FBI um, um, psychologist, uh, one of the leading FBI psychologists at the time. And they, they both signed her name to the report. And they wanted to go back and do more, and they never were able to. And there yeah. was a lid put on it. And I had never heard, I don't know if anybody else had ever heard that she had done regression therapy until we started reading the transcripts. Yeah, so well, it's just... Yeah. Darley Key, um, long before uh, this got released, um, told me about the uh, regression therapy, and she told me what the results were. And every word she told me is exactly what's in the report, to the to the tick. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, that woman lies and this and that. She's never lied. I've never caught Darley, Lynn or Darley Key in a lie, never. Um, and um, when... I got a hold of this report because they didn't want it released. And then um, it, it got leaked and got out. Um, I wrote to Darley Lynn and I said, I'd really love to do a podcast on this. And I said, but I want to get your permission to do so. I said, if anything, it shows more so that you're innocent than guilty. And uh, I think the people that are interested in your case should know about this. I said, it's, it's a very interesting piece of information. It said, well, Rich, I agree with you that it does show more of my innocence than anything. She said, but I'm going to leave that up to you as to whether or not you want to go ahead and do, you know, a podcast on it. So I, so I did it and it, it, it went really well, but a lot of people that are physicians and psychiatry and psychology, they will tell you that they don't have a lot of, um, and this is only to be fair, they don't have a lot of um, faith in these regression therapies. Okay. Um, even Tara will tell you that she doesn't have a lot of faith, and she has a degree in, in, in psychology. She said she doesn't have a lot of faith in regression therapy. Uh, so, And that's just to be fair about it. You know, it's it's just what they feel out there in the uh, uh, psychiatric world, I guess. Yeah, I mean, and I don't know, you know, the validity of it, but I just felt like after hearing that, it kind of made it kind a lot of things made sense that didn't make sense before. So I just feel like it's worth for anyone that wants to look at the case. If you haven't seen that yet, the regression therapy, it is worth reading and um, looking at. Right. In my opinion, yeah, it's. Uh, I, I think it's it's a, a, um, a very interesting read, and um, I think it does hold some water um, because it it does kind of indicate some of the um, the crime scene. I actually looked into that. You know, they used to like for an example, um, not to get off the topic, but they they wanted to do like on Jack Ruby, the the fellow who shot Lee Oswald, and Lee Oswald was the alleged assassin in the Kennedy assassination. Jack Ruby shot and killed Lee Oswald a, a couple of days later in the basement of the Dallas County Jail. And when the Warren Commission, which was the the government commission that was investigating the Kennedy assassination in 1964 interview Jack Ruby. Jack Ruby wanted to get this kind of test done. And back then they, it was, they called it like a lie detector truth serum kind of thing. And uh, they actually called it truth serum back then. And Jack Ruby also wanted to get a lie detector test to, you know, because he wanted to make sure that the truth was getting out. And he wanted to show that he was telling the truth about what had occurred. And um, at that time, it had a lot more credibility. Uh, which later down the road, Jack Ruby ended up getting the lie detector test, but he did not get the truth serum test that he wanted. This this is the truth serum test, which holds more water than um, um, a lie detector test. But some people think otherwise on that, and I, I don't. I don't. I'm not degreed in any way in either one of these areas to really know. Uh, but I do believe that it, it is an interesting read and it does hold some credibility. You have um, 
two of the top, you know, uh, psychologists and psychiatrists in the United States, they put their signature on this thing. Physicians don't put their signatures on something unless they feel it, it's the real thing. You know, they're not going to they're not going to damage their credibility or their reputation, you know, regardless. Now, it is true that Darley's family are the ones that purchased um, for the regression therapy. So they did pay for it. It's true. But I still know no doctor in this country that will put their name to something unless they know it for sure. I know that for a fact. You, you try to get Social Security disability or something like that. I'm sure there's people in the audience that know this. You ask your doctor, hey, can you write up a report? They won't do it. They will not do it. They'll send their files over, you know, because they have to under under the law. But they're not going to write a report. They don't do that stuff anymore. They do not put their signature to something unless they are 110% sure about something. Plus, they run the risk of uh, uh, lawsuits if they're incorrect about something. Uh, well, that's, uh, you know, I think a pretty good, you know, uh, idea of what the regression therapy has without, you know, totally going into it. And I think that I'm just happy you finally got to see Darlie Rich in after all these years. Yeah, no, she she was amazing. She really was, and and I I had to go visit her again in a heartbeat because I like to chit chat anyway. If you can't tell, and <laughs> I I really um, and she does too. So I mean, we could just sit and just talk about nothing. You're, you're for muted. Hours. Oh no, oh, Zab, I've been not saying you. things this whole time because I thought I was unmuted, but I'm muted up here. Oh my god, no wonder why. You haven't even heard me. Okay, I was muted in the wrong spot. I usually look to see if my light's blinking. Well, I muted it up here. Oh, you were good, Rich. Only what I was Zap saying, was Rich, muted. real quick. No, I'm sorry, I just screwed up. Um, do you have a list of questions when you go back August to uh, visit her? Or are you gonna ask her? No, oh, you're you muted. I can't. I think, Rich, I'm, I'm muted again. No, Rich is muted. <laughs> oh, he is. I'm not, I'm not muted now. Now you're good. Well, oh, okay. when you said somebody was muted, I'm like, oh, man, I'm looking at all my stuff here, and I must have hit the button. But anyway, um, here's here's the problem with the, with the questions, okay? You're not allowed to take anything in there with you other than a sack of change and a plastic uh, bag. Okay. So you can't write things down. So I'm going to be honest with you. You know what I did? All the questions, I wrote them out on my hand and my arm. Oh, you did? They don't check yeah, that? So when I went in there, and I told Bonnie, I said, you know, I look like a, a damn fool, but I said, I bet I'm not the first one that come up with this idea. You know, so, <laughs> That's no, I awesome. Actually, yeah. so I actually wrote everything down on my hand because oh. I, I knew I wasn't going to remember because Bathsheba wanted me to ask her something. Uh, Mr. Phillips wanted me to make a statement to her and, and some other people. And then I have my questions of my own. And, um, I wanted to make sure she got it. So yeah. I just wrote them all down. Now, Zab and Bella, you guys are starting to get pretty educated on this case. If you could think of something you want me to ask her, tell yeah, me. Yeah, let me see. I'll definitely think of some stuff. So when are you going? August, like beginning of August? Or that's like next well, month. Yeah, I know. Um, well, he, here's the thing. Darley Key got a hold of me. She goes, you know what? I, I can't make it in August. I'm supposed to go. I can't make it. And she goes, well, you fill in. I said, yeah, I'll, fill, I'll be happy to fill in. And uh, she goes, well, I don't want to say her name, but one of Darlie's best friends since they've been little girls. Okay. Um, she's going to go. She actually lives very close to me, actually. And uh, she, great, great gal, too. And uh, she goes, get with her and coordinate it. You know, so you could, you know, you guys figure this out. So I got a hold of her. Um, and she goes, Oh, I'm so glad you can go again. Somebody can, you know, fill in that spot. It's so important for her to have contact with others. And I said, I agree. So she said, give her a couple days and she'll figure it out. So I'm either going to end up going the first or second week. I think it'd be the second week of August or the last week of August. That's how it kind of goes okay, right now because cool. of the COVID. Okay. So if you guys think of any questions, because believe I me, yeah, definitely will. Darlie Lynn is very well aware of who you ladies are and what you do. Wow. So and I know she'll probably have to be careful what she can answer though. Like you said, there's certain things. Probably. But, yeah. um, I was really surprised. She told me about the story with that Rolodex. 
Uh, you know, and I told her, I, I told her, I said, darling, there's something you don't want me to say. I said, because I'm going to tell her, everybody's going to want to know, and I'm going to tell them unless you tell me not to say it. And she didn't tell me that I couldn't say that. So, wow. so I mean, just honesty coming out that she was telling me, she goes, you know, there one time I got real mad at Darren. He was being a, well, she said smart ass and said something to me and it made me mad. And I whipped the Rolodex at his head. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. and, and so like, oh, and one more thing I didn't tell you about. I have to tell you, you, you did you uh, ladies read the testimony yet of um, the one, the one neighbor, um, <laughs> The one neighbor that um, testified to the fact at the picnic that Darlie Lynn smashed a piece of cake in a Devin's face. You didn't run across I don't that, yet? that one. No, I don't, I don't think we we ended up having to skip some to get to the more juicier ones because it just seemed like we were boring reading. Good. Yeah. We did skip some, yeah, because we were, yeah, we just, yeah, we made that decision. So. I, I, I get that. I do. It, it's boring reading. Well, anyway, I asked Darlene about that. I said, one of your neighbors said that, because uh, she said, I, I never get that way. I don't have a temper. And I said, well, can you tell me about the time you smashed that cake in Devin's face? Because you know what, Rich? That did happen. She goes, but I, I said, what? Because he had a water pistol, right? He was squirting people, and, and you were telling him to stop. She goes, that's right. And he shot me in the face with it. And I, I was getting irritated, and she goes, I, I smashed his, the, the cake in his face. She goes, but Rich, I'm going to be honest with you. I wasn't trying to be violent or anything. I was trying to get him to settle down. Now, I've had other friends of Darlie Lynn's tell me that if Devin was six years old today in, in 2021, that um, he would probably be diagnosed with like an ADHD or, uh -huh. or, or something like that because he, he was very, very hyper. And, you know, you had to really keep him busy to keep him settled down, you know. Uh -huh. um, you know, and, you know, Damon was the complete opposite. Even Darley told me at the prison interview or the, the prison visitation that um, Damon was a mama's boy. Always uh -huh. wanted to be with his mommy, you know. And she said she, she really misses that. And uh, she started to get a little upset. And I told her, I said, I don't want to upset you. So let's just change the subject. And move. I said, I'm not here to upset you. You know, I'm here to support you. So I don't want to start upsetting you. So, mm -hmm. but she said, that's true. That did happen. But she said her neighbor really made it out to be like she was in some type of fit of rage or something like that. And she mm -hmm. goes, I really was. And I was in total control of myself, but he wouldn't settle down. Wow. Okay. I mean, I wow, mean, that's interesting. you know, yeah. so, um, yeah, of but, course they're making her out to be, uh, all the stories are exaggerated. Everybody's thinking right. she did it. So they're kind of like fitting the stories to this crazy late, you know what I'm saying? It's just, yeah. Huh. Well, what do you, what do you ladies think of Darren's testimony? I I've watched, uh, the one you, you ladies did a good job on that. Bella, your voice with Darren, by the way, is, is so good. <laughs> Thank you. That means a lot to me because my friend came in and he, and people probably didn't know it was my friend. And he goes, Bella's probably an amazing person with the worst Southern accent I've ever heard. And I'm like, I'm trying here. I'm from California. <laughs> well, re remember I, I live in Texas. I hear that Southern accent here in Texas a lot. You're not real far off. Believe okay, it or not. Thanks, Wait, I got to clear this actor. off. I got to clear this up. No mistake. See, that's, <laughs> confusing he wasn't comparing eileen to to darley no he wasn't can you yeah <laughs> this little thing listen, you get. listen i i i probably shouldn't even have mentioned that yeah you were comparing it to the joe and then i think well, you brought even darley her. at one point but uh, you never yeah. said darley routine yeah like darley, i wasn't no. I, w I wasn't comparing her to joe necessarily i was just saying that joe had told me over a phone conversation uh, reluctantly told me that they they were related. They were uh, cousins by some. That Joe and issue. Eileen were related, guys. Not that Darley. is correct. Not Darley Lynn. Yeah. Darley Darley Lynn is not related. Not related <laughs> yeah. to Eileen Warnos. I promise you, she is not. Um, I I studied that case. That was one of my uh, case studies um, when when uh, I I was getting uh, I was getting my education to be the activities director at the social mental rehabilitation center in uh, Newcastle PA. And the name of the place was called the next step. it was like a drop in okay. center. Um, and that was one of the cases we study. I promise you, 
Darley Lynn is not related yeah, they just, in any way to Eileen Warner. And they misunderstood that they said they thought you were talking that she was like her. No, he never yeah. said Darley Lynn was like yeah, her. No, uh, Joe, uh, Joe Joe like Douglas, her. Yeah, no, Joe Douglas is a supporter of uh, Darley Lynn, and she does know quite a bit about the case, but she she's a little bit on the, in my opinion, She's a little bit on the on the delusional side, and I have right. tried getting her to come onto my podcast, and she won't do it. She wants to be paid to come on the podcast. You know what? I and, just heard. Oh shoot! My company's here. Actually, I just shoot. Oh, um, uh, <laughs> I was I, trying I, to like uh, uh, be able to end well, this before she got here, but I just heard her. And she just said she's here. Um, I, I I apologize, Zab. I I no, tend to go don't on. And on. Oh, you're fine. I just didn't want it to cut you off when she got here, but obviously no, it, it's I fine. To, I, I um, totally understand. It, it's and Sunday. Mike's going to be barking in a minute because she's going to ring the doorbell You're and he's going to bark. Rich, thank so, you so yeah, much thank for you. coming. Yes, of and course, sharing. anytime. Yes, it's been awesome. Thank you. Um, but if you could, Zab, see if you can get a hold of Kevin. I would. I would love to come he, on a podcast. Kevin, on. He, he actually is in chat a lot, and he's as much as he has strong beliefs in one way. He's very respectable. Like maybe he at is, first no. he was, but then he like I think he fell out the group, and he understood like we're not gonna we're we're all open to other mm. opinions, even if it's different than ours. And he's actually pretty cool as far no, as him being misinformed. I agree. I think I, I, I no. I think I think he's a he's a very educated um, man. He speaks well. I I. And I promise you, I will not get disrespectful. That is not of my character to do that. Yeah, I so, see that. I mean, yeah. I know how to be. I know how to be. But, you know, <laughs> I, I, I told Darley, Darley Key and Darley Lynn, but I rep, when, when I do this stuff, I'm representing Darley. So, yeah. you know, I don't want to give the wrong impression out by shooting my mouth off because in the end, all it does is hurt Darley Lynn. It really does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think you, yeah, you're very well spoken and, yeah. and, um, and thank you, Melissa, for the, the super chat. Thanks, and, Melissa um, C. I don't yeah. know. He doesn't really, he said that Darlie doesn't really talk much about Darren, maybe because the guards are there. Um, I'm sorry. I don't mean to like rush off your question, but I do got to go because I hear yeah. my mom on now calling. <laughs> so, go, go ahead, Zev, and we'll, um, we'll talk again real soon. Okay, yes, definitely get a hold of me about I will. Me and I her, will. Me and and if, you, if you and Bella think of any questions, shoot me the questions and I'll write them down on my hand and I'll ask. Okay, yeah, we <laughs> definitely will. All right. And okay. everyone okay, tune in Monday. Don't forget yes, to tune Monday, in. Yes, Monday. I'm very Hyatt. interested yes. in hearing that. Rich, you're going to so. love yes, that. Be here, yes. Rich. Yeah. Okay. I, okay. I, I, I'm going to try. All right, ladies. I'll All right. Bye, bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank bye, bye, everybody.